the best comments? Ones. I don't know. And thank you guys so much for coming. We're very excited about today. It took every single one of us to put it together. But most importantly, I think our committee all wants to thank Scott for all of his help.
matter and blood spatter, as you're going to see here, is for evidence, and there is some trauma. Pictures to the victim, is that going to upset anybody? No. Okay. And it's, it's just... <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> It'll probably not be as cool as TV, so I mean, but sometimes people get upset. I once, and there's a young man in the front. Um, he just fell out of his chair and fell on the floor, and he seriously fainted. I've never seen anybody faint before. I mean, he was all embarrassed. But anyway, it's not that bad. But it is a homicide investigation. Some of you may have remembered this one. We picked one that was adjudicated. Uh, this one's from 04, and this involves a uh, juvenile male that was murdered uh, in the 1600 block. Well, he, he didn't die at that scene, but a shooting that happened at 1625 and a half Phillips and uh, involved a juvenile male who was breaking into a car and the homeowner uh, shot him in the head. Now the interesting part about this case and why I brought this one is the suspect, as is fairly common, claimed self-defense. And the physical evidence disproved that his claim of self-defense was actual fact. And that's very important because criminal cases oftentimes hinge on physical evidence, DNA, blood spatter interpretation, some of the other things I'm going to talk to you about, ballistic evidence, interviews, and they don't always get confessions. So evidence is very important to corroborate or refute the statements or claims of the accused. Okay? So right off the get-go, is it legal for you to shoot a person who is unarmed? It depends. Raise your hand if you think you can legally shoot an unarmed person. In your house? Or Anywhere. Raise your hand if you think you can. Okay. You can. Okay? So let's say tonight you're at home, you get woke up at 4 in the morning, you hear somebody in your living room, you arm yourself with a gun, and as you look down your hallway from your bedroom and your living room, you see a ski mask wearing guy wearing a hoodie and gloves. He's in your living room, and you yell at him, get out of my house. And he turns, and instead of running, he starts to walk up the hallway at you, and you're pointing the gun at him, and you're telling him, leave me alone, get away, get out of here. He has nothing in his hands, and he continues to walk towards you. Do you think you could articulate that you are in fear of your life? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's where you can shoot him. So you can use any force necessary to protect your, yourself by law, but no greater force. Okay. So if you tell him to get out of here, and he runs, and you shoot him in the back, you're going to be in trouble. So you can shoot a person, an unarmed person, if you can articulate that you were in fear of your life or protecting your family. A lot of people think that that's not the case, but it is. So the law changed two years ago, and it made it the responsibility of law enforcement to prove or to disprove a self-defense claim, where prior to that, a defendant and his attorney had to prove that self-defense occurred. So now we have to disprove that. Okay? So, if you have any questions, and I see the camera's trying to uh, go, uh, go on me here, but I, I never stand in one place, so I'll keep you busy. <laughs> is that Montana law or is that U.S. law? Montana law. And each state obviously has their own laws, and then federal law uh, supersedes state law. Are you required to try to disprove self-defense, or is that just a case-by-case -case type deal? Say it again. Are you required to try to disprove self-defense? So do you go on in on every single one and and try to look and see if it... Good question. And if you have anything, Dean, just fire off. Um, we, don't, we don't do that just to do it, but what we do is we try to determine the facts and the truth of the case. And that's another thing, too. A lot of people think the police are working for the victim, and that's not the case. If you're a good investigator, you should be unbiased, and you should be trying to find the truth, because the victims lie sometimes. Unfortunately, they do. And do suspects and witnesses lie? Suspects lie all the time. So our job is to be unbiased, collect the facts, present a factual case to a prosecutor, and usually a case that can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt in court. Okay? So this area that we're talking about, the north side, um, or as Hoffman would disagree, the west side, but this north side area, Missoula, uh, which is bordered by Russell Street to the west, Scott Street to the east, Broadway and Tool to the south, and then Phillips, which is running through the middle. Our victim was a 17-year-old 
uh, male who uh, had most recently attended Sentinel High School, but he had not been in school for a couple of weeks to the time of the shooting, and prior to that he attended Hellgate. He had been visiting a relative at 1131 Sherwood, and he got there just a little bit before midnight. That's always intriguing to me whenever we do death investigations, because if you think about it, we all have routines. Every one of us has a routine every morning, how we get ready, put your makeup on, eat your breakfast, get dressed, you usually have a routine. And every night you go to bed, you have a routine. Do you agree with me? And every day we get ready for the day, we assume that we'll be going to bed that night. And some of us don't. And so it's always intriguing when people are killed that if they had done anything a little differently, would things have changed? For example, head-on collisions. You know, if you would have went one mile an hour faster or slower for the previous 30 minutes, you would have been 1,200 feet farther up or farther down the road when that drunk came across the center line. When those guys, these pedestrians that keep getting hit, you know, the recent ones on Brooks, those guys that come in from out of town, they're on the way to Yellowstone, they got a local motel, they ordered pizza, they got some beer, they took showers, they asked the, the clerk where was a good bar within walking distance because they just wanted to walk. He told them Harry Davids, and they started walking. And then the guy that got drunk in Lolo, and he came all the way through there and ultimately hit him at Paxton and Brooks. I mean, had they been five seconds farther ahead in their walk, he would have probably hit two of them. If it would have been about seven or eight seconds, would have hit all three of them. And if they would have been five or six seconds back, the car would have went sliding right in front of them. So it's always interesting, you know, as humans, we're pretty resilient. Sometimes people survive some pretty horrendous trauma, and then other times we die of pretty simple, simple trauma. So, Randy, as this uh, male's first name was, Randy Brown, was at his relative's house, and it was before midnight when he got there. He'd been drinking a little bit, but the, the relative that he was visiting didn't know that. And so when it was time to go, just after midnight, he was going to walk to his mom's house at 1901 Maple. So it was about nine or ten blocks, probably about a ten minute walk, and he'd done it a lot. And so he left the house just shortly after midnight. That's the last he was seen by anyone other than the suspect. <coughs> so as Randy walks westbound, he starts to look through cars, and he's prowling cars. And he probably intended to do that based on what he was wearing at the time, and we'll talk about that later too. And when he gets to a car at 1625 and a half Phillips, he starts to rummage through this car, and that ultimately leads to a confrontation with the homeowner. This location, uh, you see Phillips at the top, and this location we're talking about is a small house, 1625 and a half, in the alley. So this is the alley that he was walking in westbound, Phillips is at the top, the laser doesn't work in the... Anyway, and you see that red Isuzu Trooper, that car that's parked directly east of that location, is the car that he was in. This is a very small house, has a footprint about 800 square feet. <coughs> there's a door that's a common door that they all use, and then there's a sliding glass door here. This is north, east, west, and south. And this is where the car's parked. And we know that Randy came, I know how you go back now, Hoffman. We know that Randy came from the east, and he was traveling west. Like we said, he was prowling cars, and obviously that's what he was doing uh, when he was confronted at this location. <clears throat> 911 records all incoming calls, so all our radio traffic is recorded, all the emergency traffic with fire, police, and sheriff is recorded, all phone calls are recorded that come in too, and oftentimes they provide good evidence for our cases. In this case, is no different. So at three minutes and three seconds past midnight on April 11, <coughs> 2003, a woman at 1609 Phillips, apartment number two, calls to report that she heard what she thought was a gunshot. Officer Sheevan and Sergeant Welsh are dispatched to this location and uh, you'll get a radio traffic.
Everything's actual time in, in actual time chronologically too, so you'll see the difference. There's multiple dispatchers down there doing multiple tasks. And at 5 minutes and 12 seconds past midnight, the suspect himself, Samuel Yates, uh, calls to report that he just shot who he described as a kid breaking into his car. Sergeant Welsh arrives on scene first. He comes into the alley westbound from the east end of the alley, and he sees Mr. Yates wearing a pair of jeans and nothing else with a cell phone in his hand, kneeling over the victim who is laying on his back, uh, his head is in a northwesterly direction, his feet, well, his head are in a uh, southwesterly direction, and his feet are in a northeasterly direction. Uh, his left foot is crossed over his right ankle, his right arm is under his torso, and he has sustained massive trauma to his head. Now, at that point, he is alive. Um, he's not cognitive or conscious, but uh, he has angular breathing. He's struggling to live, uh, but not consciously. So when we sustain trauma, uh, in this case, the diaphragm is working to pump air into our lungs. Our body is trying to conserve our energy and to protect the organs. But he has brain damage that has been determined to be uh, immediately incapacitating neurological injury, which was good for him because he probably knew nothing. It just was very immediate, which isn't always the case. Now, it's important that we describe things and explain things to the jury because they come up with ideas. Can we always explain everything in every case? No. No. And sometimes, and all too often, TV puts us at a disadvantage because the technology the TV represents in an hour program is just not realistic. I've never had perfect surveillance film that you see on TV that you can zoom into to get a picture of <laughs> <laughs> There are always digital programs that are pixelated out by the time you try to get smaller scenes. But anyway, why do you think the victim's in the position that he's in with his left foot over his right and his right arm underneath his torso laying on his back? What? He's running away. Who said that? He rolled him over, and that's exactly how his legs got twisted and his arm got underneath his body. So that's important because when we talk about his injuries, they're all to the front of his face from the impact into the alley uh, surface. So Sergeant Welsh advises the suspect to get away from the victim. He stands there briefly. Uh, Officer Sheeman arrives within about 20 seconds, and then Officer Wickman arrives shortly thereafter. They take Yates into custody. They check the condition of the victim, they call for ambulance, and then the gun is recovered also by the third officer who secures it. So, we'll listen to this and, and see what you get from the suspect's call to 911. Yeah, get 
somebody here real fast, please? We're going to get somebody headed that way. Where is he shot at? I'm not sure. Okay. So you shot sure. him? Did you I need somebody him? here right now. Okay, He's sir, breathing. Sir, I understand that. I'm getting someone headed. I need to ask you some more questions. Did you shoot him? Yes, I did. Okay. Where is he shot at? Can you tell? I can't tell. It's, it's dark. Okay, but he is breathing? Yep, I need somebody here right okay. now. All right. Um, is he outside there? Yes, he is. He's right here. He's right here behind my car. Okay. And this is in front? No, so this is in the alley. In the alley. Okay. Yep. Okay, um, all right. Is he conscious at all? Is he no, he's not. He's not, but he's breathing, he so breathing. hurry. Okay. Yes, please. My partner already has help dispatch that way. Okay. Thank you on the line. Thank you. Okay, where, where is the gun, sir? It's sitting in the front seat of my car. Okay, what are some important things Mr. Yates said during that phone conversation? He shot him. Uh, he shot him. What else? He's behind me. Still alive. Say again? Still alive. He's still alive. And where's the gun? Where is the gun? In the car. In the car. Okay. He found him. He's behind the car. The kid is behind the car. It's too dark to tell where he shot him. Too dark to tell him where he shot him. Does that sound weird? Yeah. 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 He's breathing. Uh, he is breathing. What else? <laughs> what else do you say is important? He said it was a kid breaking into his car. Gave a motive. When the police can prove motive and connection between victim and suspect, we have a higher solvability rate of any crime. So, in most homicides, about 70%, most 70%, the victim knows the suspect that kills him. In this case, they didn't know each other. But, do we have a motive? Yes. He's breaking into his car. And we have a suspect and a victim at the scene, which is good, because you want to try to put the crime scene on the suspect or put the suspect in the crime scene. Do you think this conversation that he says can be used against him? Yes. yes. Was he Mirandized? No. Can that be used against him? Yes. Yes. Because remember Miranda, or maybe you don't know, Miranda only applies when two things are occurring. You're in custody and you're being asked accusatory questions. If either one of those aren't there, Miranda doesn't apply. So phone conversations, Miranda doesn't apply. Okay? So did he confess or admit what he did? He admitted. And what is the difference between a confession and an admission? What? Not under duress, kind of? Not the duress part. He wasn't being questioned. Yes. What? He wasn't being questioned by a... Official that was not, not, not that he's not being questioned. He admits being guilty. He admits being guilty. And what's the difference? Do you think the police want a confession or an admission? Confession. We want a confession. And what is the difference? You know, details. Right? An admission admits you did something. A confession provides who, what, when, where, and how, and why. Right? So admission's okay, but ideally we want a confession because it's always, always important why people did what they did. Okay? That's always important. So, he's admitted that he shot this kid, and uh, we recovered the gun, we recovered him at the scene, we have him at the victim, and he's transported to the police department. And I get called out just a little after midnight, I think it was like 20 after midnight. I know that when I went home that night, it was about 9.30 p.m. that night, and I had worked 21 hours straight. So we worked lots of... 15, 16, 17 hour days on call outs, but when to work over 20 hours is kind of rare and it kind of makes you mushy. But uh, homicides, the first 48 hours are critical. This one wasn't a whodunit, it was we had the crime scene, we had the suspect, we had the victim, and we had the weapon. And all that was very, very good to have right off the get go, but it was still a very long day. <coughs> okay, uniformed patrol officers secure the crime scene, and this is the crime scene as you see it looking in the alley from the east to the west, okay? Where you see this flashlight on the ground is where the victim is found and he has been transported from this location by emergency services, okay? When you secure a crime scene, everything within that perimeter is going to be documented that says any relevance or importance. So, rubber gloves. Medical waste, you don't just walk over and throw that in the garbage, it's part of your crime scene. Once the tape goes up, everything that's relevant has to be accounted for. This is the inner crime scene, 
which is immediate where the crime scene or action or activity took place. Then there'd be another one probably behind the person taking the pictures that keeps people farther back away from us uh, or people that are involved, like the media. This location involves us as using Trooper and that door where the suspect came out. And on the ground here is a receipt from Broadway or 610 West Broadway of the suspect's credit card, and that's a Safeway. This is a uh, mantle lantern kind of uh, the thing that makes the light. You know, when you first light it, it burns, and then it's for a, a lantern mantle, I think it's called. You can also see the doors open, and those are the items on on the ground. So when you first get to a crime scene, sometimes it's easy to identify what might be suspect or what might be evidence, excuse me, and what isn't. And once you release that crime scene, you can't go back. So it's better to err on the side of taking everything that could be than missing something. So these items are on the ground, and they're on the ground outside the open door. Here's the view of the interior of the car. This is another receipt from 610 West Broadway from the suspect, and this is where the gun was recovered. What do you see here that's of any evidentiary value? What? Lots of cigarettes. Cigarettes are a great source of DNA, but we don't need it in this case because we know who the suspect is. The car is a dump. The car is a dump. What are those black things? What are the black things? What do you think that black thing is? Credit card. What is the black thing? It's the faceplate of a stereo. That is quite a crapper stereo, not one worth giving your life over, not that any stereo would be. But does that corroborate his statements that the kid was breaking into his car? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So relevant points to where the kid, the victim, is found from uh, the point of contact by the claim of the suspect. And what's important here is this is another package of those mantle lanterns, and there was some camping equipment in the back of the car. So they look like items that are from the car that somehow got outside the car. And then we have blood evidence. Uh, you'll see a blood flow, which is the dark, long part on the top. And then you have tissue and bone fragments and blood spatter. Blood spatter is incredible evidence that really helps us reenact or place people in reference to each other before the bloodletting occurred and it's great for refuting or corroborating statements. Blood will respond, or its response to action of force is always consistent, okay? So low velocity blood spatter, for example, is gonna be blood that was created from a uh, impact or uh, force that was less than five feet per second, and it's gonna be greater than four millimeters in size, and that's gonna be like a punch. Medium velocity blood spatter is going to be one to four millimeters in size, and it's going to result from velocity that's about between five and 20 feet per second, which would be like a weapon that's swung, like a hammer or a baseball bat, someone that's got a fulcrum and it creates an increased velocity at the end. And then high velocity blood spatter is going to be less than one millimeter in size, and the greater the velocity, the smaller the blood spatter. What do you think creates high speed blood spatter? Bullets, because all bullets travel about 900 feet per second or greater, and high velocity blood spatter is created at 100 feet per second. What else? Car, car accidents or high speed trauma. Machinery accidents, high speed trauma created. And then what do you think creates the smallest blood spatter? Bomb. Very good. Explosions. So those three things create blood spatter. And blood spatter is important because blood will only, without a barometric influence will only travel outside the body about 32 to 36 inches before it's affected by what? Gravity. Gravity. And that's if we're not in an environment where the wind's blowing or something that's going to affect those blood droplets in flight. And what's important about that, let's say that there is blood spatter here on this wall right here and it lines up with a bullet hole in my upper chest Yet this guy says, I was this close to him when he shot me. Is that absolutely impossible? <coughs> it is, because the blood would only travel 
outside of my body about that far before it started to drop. Okay, so for it to be there at the same height of the wound, I would have to be within 36 inches of that surface. I move one foot out, what's that blood spatter going to do? It's going to drop. It's going to drop even farther and it's going to drop to where it's maybe not even there. Okay? There's other things that blood can create too. Voids are very good blood evidence. Voids are when an object that has been, has blood introduced to it, has been moved after the fact. So somebody holds somebody against the wall and stabs them. Blood is coming out, it's landing on their shoes, it's landing on their clothes. And when they turn to run, there's going to be two voids there from their footprints. And oftentimes, in fresh blood like that, that first step will step into some blood, and then that next step, and now this first step after the blood transfer to the bottom of your shoe is going to create a transfer pattern, and that's another type of blood evidence. Let's say in a shooting, um, you have a shooting in which a victim was shot, and you have four expended casings on the ground, three have blood spatter on them, and one does not. What round hit the victim? The fourth did. Why is that? How do you know that? <laughs> there there before the Very good. So number one was fired, it hit the ground, two hit the ground, three hit the ground, four hit the victim, and that one's in the air when those three get blood introduced to them. That's why the fourth one wouldn't have it. Okay? So blood spatter, when we go on for a long time, is very good and, like I said, it's great for refuting or corroborating statements. Now, Blood, invariably, in exit wounds, is always, unless it erupted, going to travel the same directionality as the force acting upon it. What might interrupt blood exiting a wound? What? Clothing. Clothing. Or? Hair. Hair, right? Hair would do it. Um, <laughs> uh, Clothing, other things, uh, uh, some of them might be behind them, anything that could interrupt it. But if it's not interrupted and it continues and it lands, it will tell you the directionality of force acting upon it. This right here is blood spatter that's going this direction. And do you think that larger pieces of spatter and tissue and bone fragments are going to travel farther or shorter? A lot of people say shorter, but it's actually farther because velocity. Right? So if we took a bunch of tissues and we wadded them up as tight as we could and threw them as hard as we could, then we picked up a baseball and threw it, what would go farther? The baseball, okay? So as you can see, we have larger pieces of bone tissue and fragments and blood, and this happened, this point is here because it's going to have to come from a, about five feet high and it's going to travel 32 to 36 inches before it starts to drop. And as it drops, this is here. And this was not in this environment before. What's important about this that you can see after we just talked about blood evidence? Timing. What? The timing. It's very good. There's no blood on it. So, was this on the ground before the blood was introduced or after? After. after. More than likely, this was probably in the victim's hand or it was in his clothing and it fell because once he sustained and immediately, incapacitating neurological injury, you have no control over your grip, your legs, I mean, you wouldn't stand anymore, your knees would buckle, I mean, you have no muscular control at that point. So, blood spatter is traveling in that direction, and where it gets to, we have larger pieces of bone and blood and tissue, which would be consistent with him moving kind of in a westerly, southwesterly direction from that southeast corner of the house, which is going to come into play uh, big. And you'll see uh, bone fragments a little bit there, and like I said, the bigger pieces are going to travel the farthest, which will help you with directionality. Okay, there's a void here, which is right here. Why do you think, what do you think caused that void? <laughs> His head, very good. So, as he laid there, he had sustained a serious head injury, and he was bleeding out, and we have different spatter here now. These are drops that are probably at about a 90 to 80 degree angle. What do you think caused those? Who said that? What did you say? Not turning. These were after the fact, and they're after this happened. Do you have any? It happened when you rolled them over. Okay, very good on that one because that's probably from this point to this point, and now his face is rolled over. Uh, this thick blood is real common when you're shot in the head. 
Um, and, you know, he's breathing. So, I mean, that's another thing, too. You can tell oftentimes how soon a person dies by how much blood there is because if your heart's pumping, it's going to pump blood out of your wound. If your heart stops immediately, then blood is only going to come out of your wound by what? Gravity. Gravity. So let's say you're stabbed through the heart and you fall on your back and die quickly. Might there be very little blood? Because the blood's going to start to settle in the bottom part of your body. And you're laying on your side and you've been cut seriously in the throat and stuff where you're breathing and you're coughing and you're having air, you know, that's going to bleed a lot more. So he has been turned over. This is a unique pattern. Does anyone have any idea of how that happens? Huh? He's not, it's not uh, aspirated blood. It's probably when he was picked up by the paramedics and they picked him up to put him on the gurney, this is dripping down blood that is dripping from about a 90 to 80 degree angle. And so maybe he had blood on his hand and it was hanging off or some part as they probably moved him and that's what caused that. So you want to try to explain as much as you can. His hat, there's something hugely important in this picture. What is it? A white blood. There is no hole in the hat. This is medical waste on the left side. And you can see how critical this evidence is. Do you see anything here that's vastly important? This hat wasn't on it when he was shot. No, go The direction of his hand? What's this? That right there is a bullet jacket fragment. You can see it right here, and that is huge. Now, if that is very small, and you think a police officer, a fireman, emergency medical person could easily step on that, and it would stick to the tread of their boot, and they'd be gone out of the scene, right? That's why it's so key to secure a crime scene as fast as you can. Now, when bullets travel and they impact something, the jacketing commonly comes off, and the interior portion of the bullet continues or breaks apart. But when it first hits something, the jacketing will commonly come off. So even if it goes through tissue, the jacketing commonly comes off. Now, bullets, you know, when we used to shoot muskets and they were just big round balls, they didn't have much accuracy. So you have rifling in the barrel, and as rifling as the bullets fired is spun, and it comes through there, and then it can match bullets to the rifling of a barrel and to a gun. So as it flies, it's spinning, and that fact that it's spinning causes it to fly straighter until the energy is just gone, and then it will drop. But if we use lead bullets, lead is a soft uh, metal, and it wouldn't fly as straight. If you were to use fully um, copper or steel bullets, they would, the price would be high. So what a jacketing is, usually copper, it goes over the top of the lead, which is cheaper metal, and those are the things that are part of the bullet as it flies. And so when it hits things, the jacketing commonly comes off. Now in shootings, it's very important if you can prove two linear points, you have an approximate path of a bullet, right? So if we have a bullet hole here, and we have an entry point through this window, and the window didn't break all apart, it's still a hole, I can hold a laser here, line it up, right? Then I can go to that point, and I can hold a laser, shoot it through this hole, and see where it goes outside to have an approximate point of origin. Now, do I know if it was fired 5 feet past this window, or 150 <laughs> feet past this window? We don't know. However, let's say there's a building 23 feet past this window, and its wall is high enough that that angle would have impacted it. Did the shooting occur between these two buildings? Yes. Okay. So, in this case, we could never prove a point. We could never prove two points. But what's key here is we have this ballistic evidence that's at the location where the victim falls, and the victim is at the end of blood spatter that travels the same directionality of the force, which is the bullet, acting upon the point of trauma, the head, correct? Okay. These are called tents, and these are put out by Barb. She'll show you this when we walk outside in a little bit. These are everything that's important that we're going to reference. And so if we need to talk about number eight when we go to court or whatever, that's how we know what number eight is. And She'll explain this to you, but we can replicate a crime scene via computer, uh, or we can even lay it out again, which I think she's doing out there, and then we have that document. So you always use a permanent fixture like uh, 
uh, like a telephone pole or a traffic light or a structure. You wouldn't use like a tree if you could help it because that might be gone you know, later. Or a car that could be moved. These are all points. Here's the things we talked about. 15 and 16 are pebbles. And I have no idea how Barb found this other than she's about this high to the ground anyway. But <laughs> these pebbles were seriously <coughs> not much bigger than a pencil eraser. And she found one here with blood on it and there with blood on it, which was unbelievable. And if I forget to bring that up, remind me when we talk later. But these two points have blood. These are the only two points east of this southeast corner that had any blood. All the other blood evidence is west of that. So after we see the crime scene, the victim, the suspect's been held in the police department. We go to the crime scene, we see what's up so we can know when we're talking to him what he's talking about. Because if you don't go see the crime scene, you might not be picturing things in your mind the same way as they are. So we go there so we know what he's talking about. Then we stop by the hospital to see the condition of the victim. The victim's still alive, but obviously there's an ambu bag there. They're pumping air into him, keeping him alive. He would have died had he not got to the hospital. But he's being intubated, and now he is artificial breathing, and he, he's living or he's alive. He doesn't have any brain activity at that point. Uh, and he's transferred to ICU, uh, where he lives until about 4 o'clock that afternoon. What's important here is you can see he's got some trauma on the left side of his head. He's got an abrasion here. He's got two broken teeth, abrasion on his lower lip. He's got an abrasion on his right elbow, and abrasion here on his arm. Those are all from the point that he collapsed and impacted the ground. So we know because the immediately incapacitated neurological injury didn't even allow him to put his hand out to break his fall as a reflex, so we know that he dropped immediately. Now, that coming into play a little bit more because, you know, is he at this point when he's running? Is he at this point when he drops? Either way, his legs are going to buckle. He's going to collapse downward with a little bit of forward momentum. This is concerning because we met with the suspect briefly, and he says he heard a noise. He went outside in his well. He looked out his window. He saw somebody in his car. He was armed with a 357 Magnum. He opened the door, and he said, freeze. The kid turned and came at him, and he shot him. And that's what he originally told us in our initial interview with him. Now, we've got a problem with that because if someone comes at you and you shoot them, where would you expect them to have sustained a gunshot wound? Somewhere in the front. Now, that's not always the case because oftentimes in law enforcement involved shootings, and you probably heard this and never knew this, people are shot in the side and the back. Why do you think that is? To turn a blessing. Well, They've realized I made a serious mistake at this point, and now they've turned, and then that's when the shots are being fired. So if you hear, you know, when someone's been shot once in the chest, they're shot in the side and twice in the back by the police. I mean, that commonly happens. You know, a, a perfect example, I can think of one that wasn't here, but it was a Halloween party in another state, and the police were there for a loud party, and somebody inside the window that could see the officer pointed a gun at him through the window, just a costume, toy gun, and the officer shot and killed him through the window, and he was shot once here and once in the back of the neck, because I'm sure what happened is he was laughing about it. As soon as he saw the officer draw, you know, he was like, uh-oh. So the problem we have here, we don't have any injuries that are ballistic to the front of his body, and we have an injury to the back of his head. Now, does this mean these are where those injuries are at? No. No, because your head swells when it sustains trauma. So if you picture taking a basketball, Put an X on it, and then you sustain trauma to it, and it swells. So that X going to move on that? Okay. So we know, though, and the bandaging can, could cause that, too. I mean, it could be over here, and the bandaging is less there. But anyway, we know he doesn't have injury to the front of himself. Victim's clothing is collected. What do you think we're looking for in the victim's clothing? We're looking for... Gunshot residue. Can we see that with our eyes? No. no. But what we can see, this is nylon clothing. What do you think would happen to nylon clothing if you were close and fired a gun at it? It would melt. Also, when a, gun, when a bullet's fired, in that instant that the bullet goes down the barrel, it's because all that gunpowder ignited in the cartridge. 
a lot of that gunpowder is expended in that fraction of a second. That's what creates the energy, but not all of it is gone. And some of it goes down the barrel with the gun. And again, after it gets a certain distance out of the barrel, it's affected by what? Gravity. Gravity. And this is going to come into play because this is how you can tell how far gunshot residue comes from each individual gun. And this is going to be important in this case. If you're close enough to a person, those little pieces of burning granular uh, gunpowder will embed themselves and they'll be in the, in the clothing, they'll be in the skin, you know, so if you were to take a gunshot, put it right against a skin, you would have all that soot and everything would be in a tight circle. As you move it away from, what's going to happen in that circle? It's going to get bigger, right? And if you create an angle, you're going to have more of an oblong, like a football kind of laceration entry point. So that's how you can tell where the gun is, things like that. That comes into play. Do you think people ever kill people and then try to make it look like a suicide? Okay, that happens a lot. So a good example of that, blood evidence again. Do you think someone who commits suicide should ever have blood on the inside of their palm? Near impossible, right? Because if I'm holding a gun in that fraction of a second, there'd be no way that a little bit of black back spatter will occur in close contact head wounds, and that's only because of the underlying bone under our tissue there, but you will not have blood on, on the hands of a person who shot themselves. That's almost irrefutable, okay? So that's key. If you have blood spatter on the front of the hand, and then someone put their gun in their hand. So anyway, in this case, we don't see... You know, I don't see rippage uh, from what would appear to be the gun, but we do have blood, which is the victim's blood. What do you see about this that catches your attention? Uh, all black. Does that mean every kid that's wearing all black clothing is being shady at night? No. No. Yes. Does, that mean kids are, <laughs> does that mean kids who are being shady commonly wear all dark clothing? Well, why do they do that? Before you can't see them and they can hide, right? So, we have some problems here, though. What's this? This is a rib. It's actually a cut. Why, what can that be explained by? Trauma shears when paramedics are at the scene. At the hospital, they cut your clothes off. And are they concerned about entry points and bullets and knives? <laughs> They're not. So, you know, we try to get the clothing as fast as we can. Obviously, the victim's well-being is paramount. But they will cut right through, and sometimes they compromise the evidence. We want to get the clothes as fast as we can. But we want to explain, and that's exactly right. Those cuts are from his clothes being cut off of him at the hospital. <laughs> this gun is an old 357. This is the officer that seized it and how he documented it. In the, the number two position, it's got an empty cylinder. And it's got an expended cartridge in the number one position. Number one's at 12 o'clock and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, around like that. So as he unloads this gun, that's been unfired. You can tell the difference, right? The primer had a divot in the first one. That's been unfired. And he documents how he finds this gun. Is there anything suspicious about that? One's missing. Is that explainable or suspicious? And you ask yourself, well, if he took one bullet out, why didn't he take the other one out? But if he took one bullet out, why didn't he take all the bullets out? Is this explainable? Yeah. Yes, because older males usually, and I guess younger ones are passed down from your father or grandfather, but usually older males will commonly carry a revolver with an empty cylinder under the hammer. Because if you took a revolver with the cylinder loaded and dropped it and it hit that hit the um, copy mechanism, it could have an accidental discharge. So if you have an empty cylinder, the hammer is sitting on an empty cylinder, you drop the gun, it will not fire, right? With a revolver, when you pull the trigger, you pull in the trigger, causes the hammer to come back, and as the hammer comes back, the cylinder rotates one position, and then it drops, and then the bullet's fired. Then you pull the trigger again, the hammer comes back, <laughs> rotates the cylinder one more time, and we can look at cylinders and we can tell what cylinder was last fired to by the rings that are created by the gases that ignite when the bullet, when the gunpowder goes off. So you always look for that too because that should be consistent with what's underneath the hammer if the gun hasn't been messed with. Okay? So this is explainable and this is consistent with him firing one round. Evidence recovered from the suspect. As I said, you want to either put the suspect at the crime scene or put the crime scene on the suspect. Do we have to do that here? He was found at the crime scene, and he's already admitted he's involved in the shooting. What do you think we're looking for in his hands? You can't see gun GSR, gunshot residue, but we test for that. 
Now that is very fragile stuff and very common. You'll have people involved in shootings just like him, and you have and you do the test, and the crime lab finds no GSR in his hands because if my hands are sweating, I'm handcuffed in the back of a car. My hands are sitting against. We don't have cushion seats now; they're plastic. But if I one time do this, it can be it can be gone. Sometimes we don't find it in their hands, and we commonly find it where? The clothing. Not the clothing. Fingernails. No. Face. face. Why is that? They rub their face. Uh, you have oil. Okay. If you think about the oil, so you commonly find gunshot powder around the uh, forehead and around the nose, even if you don't find it in the hands. That doesn't really tell you who shot the person. That tells you that that person was present where a gun was discharged, okay? Because you're, you're linking them, you got the GSR on them. We're looking for blood here, too. And he does have some of the victim's blood on him. Now, that's not an issue here because he doesn't deny touching him. He rolled him over. Um, but had he did what he did and thought, oh shit, went in his house, got in bed, and called 911 and said, hey, uh, I live at 1625 and a half Phillips, and I just heard a shot, and I'm looking out, I can see somebody laying in my alley, and they try to cover it up. So that's why you look for things like that. So we still document it because it's evidence, and we go from there. But he doesn't, he doesn't discount touching the victim because he went out, he checked on him, he even rolled him over to check his breathing. Now the important thing here is he called 911 at 5, 512, but that wasn't the first call he made. That was the second call. The first call he made on his cell phone was to his sister to tell her to come and get his kids. Now when he told his sister that, why do you think he did that? Do you think he thought he was an innocent person that would be able to convey that to the police? No, he realized he made a huge mistake. We'll talk about some other decisions he made. Now you go back to the following day and you look at the crime scene because obviously that gives you a better understanding than when all the pictures are so dark, right? The crime scene has been released, okay? You can see here, this vehicle hasn't been moved. This is the point we're talking about, very close proximity. Here's where the victim's found, or the blood that's, uh, the fire department's put the, they put the stuff down to clean up the biological mess. And this is the contact point that we're talking about. Now what's important here, we don't have any ballistic evidence or blood spatter going north. We don't have any ballistic evidence or, gun spat or blood spatter going east against the car. We don't have any going south towards the fence. But where do we have it? We have it going southwesterly from this corner, which is going to be key, because he claims he never left this porch and he shot this victim. He shot the victim when he came at him when he was confronted right here. If he sustained an immediately incapacitating neurological injury and he's shot here, where is the body going to be? And if he's shot here and you have an exit wound, where's the blood spatter going to be? Probably against the car, right? Or somewhere in this area, and it's not. And this point really shows you can't even see where he's found from that angle, but we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Taking these measurements to show you how close this was, this stoop is two feet nine inches. From the stoop to the side of the car is four feet five and a half inches, which gives a distance of seven feet two and a half inches. Victim's torso was probably about nine inches thick. Suspect's torso was probably about 12 to 14 inches thick. So we can take two feet off of that, and we're now at about five feet, which is about from me to her. Now in five feet, it's gonna become critical as to when you interpret someone to the threat or not, okay? Can you shoot an unarmed person? Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's what he's claiming, that he was in fear of his life, and we're gonna, we're gonna blow that up in the interview. But anyway, this is about how close they are when he confronts him. Now, that would be if I'm shooting a gun like this, right? If I put the gun out here, now the gun's even closer to her, and you would assume that the gun is gonna be held like that, but we're at this close distance. Now, do you think Sometimes a second or two seconds can be a long time. Because we do things instinctually, subconsciously our minds make decisions and they actually make more decisions than our conscious thought, right? Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Was my hand coming towards you? Yes. Okay. Did you consciously know that? Did you consciously say close my eyes or subconsciously? 
Probably yep, so he, his mind perceived a threat, closed his eyes to protect his eyes. He didn't even think about that. And that was way less than one second, right? So, one one thousand, two one thousand. Is that a long time to tell if someone is coming at you or moving away from you? Keep that in mind, okay? So, seven feet, two and a half inches. To this corner is ten feet. However, this linear line would impact this corner before it got to where he was found. Is that important? That's really important because he didn't run directly at the guy as close as he could have. He had to actually run a little ways away to make that corner. And we don't know, only Sam Yates and God know what route Randy really took. But at some point he had to go away from him a little bit. He did not come, even if he's trying to run, he did not come at him because he would have hit the side of the house. Make sense? So, now Algebra, that you never thought you'd use, comes important here because as we translate this, this is important. He claims he never left this step. Never left the step. If he never left the step and he shot him somewhere in here, the victim would have dropped in here, right? You'd have ballistic evidence going that way, you'd have blood spatter. But we have the victim here, we have ballistic evidence here, and we have blood spatter that's originating somewhere in this part, and it's got a cone shape, which is moving outward from the velocity that's acting upon it. This is key. Second thing is, well, how do we know that the kid wasn't just there and his head was more rotating on his, on his shoulders and he took three or four more steps because it was an immediately incapacitating neurological injury? So we know that the bullet passed through the back of his head, just below, just to the left midline, and came out somewhere around above his eye right here, and he's moving away. Um, so Mr. Yates says that he was on the porch. The victim had to take some route to get from the point of confrontation to the point where he's found. Mr. Yates claimed he never left the porch, but we know by fact that's a lie, right? No ballistic evidence, no blood evidence, which is more important. And the key here is he had to have stepped off the porch because as the bullet passes through the victim, it passes from the back of his head through the side and out, and it exits. Now, why is that important? That's very important because there's a difference between coming at me and me shooting you in self-defense and you now running from me and me adjusting my movement because I'm mad, right? We're going to talk about that. Me adjusting my movement and shooting you in the back of the head as you're running from me. Is that self-defense? That's not self-defense. And the injuries sustained by the victim, entry and exit, and the 357 is a very effective bullet and caliber. So, we're going to pause here, and this is where we're going to turn it over to our fortunate, our evidence technician, and she's going to, I believe, step outside and replicate the crime scene. We have already go okay. Took the night of, of, of the crime. And that's one of my jobs as a crime scene technician. A big part of the job is to uh, record the measurements of the scene for exactly this purpose, only, you know, we might actually have to uh, replicate the entire scene for a jury. So we want to make sure that we've got good measurements and that we can place all of the evidence that we picked up at that time back into that crime scene if we need to do it. So that's why we are able to do this today. As I said, it's, it, you know, we were out here, it's kind of in a hurry. We had curbs to jump up over and garbage cans in the way and stuff like that. So it's it's not precise, but you really get the feeling of how close stuff really was. So this is the porch, and um, this is the corner of the house. So these measurements are good. Uh, that's the car right there. So you see, I mean, you can kind of get a feeling now. He comes out, and not only is it just the car and the kid, but the door to the car is open, too, and I think that's a big factor because that door takes up space and further closes down this available space right in here. These numbers are marking um, evidence that was on the ground at that location, and it's uh, evidence, it's stuff that came actually came out of the car. So we can show that, well, yeah, you know, he was right. The kid was in his car. The kid was stealing stuff out of the car because the kid ended up having stuff on him that came out of his car. 
lantern mantles and stuff. I mean, you know, he's just poking around, just getting cigarettes, you know, stuff like that. So um, the, that's what these numbers are, are um, indicating here is just uh, the location where I picked up certain evidence. And I can tell you that um, 14 were some cigarette butts that had come out of the car because his uh, the floor of his car was littered with cigarette butts. Uh, we have 13 um, was some lantern mantles that the kid maybe had in his hand or whatever, hadn't stashed away yet. Uh, 12 um, is a Safeway receipt that actually uh, was tied back to Mr. Gates. Um, Eleven is an ATM receipt, also Mr. Yates. Sixteen is interesting in that it is um, Number four was a wad of toilet tissue, and 
there was toilet tissue draped over the back seat in the victim's car, or, or in Mr. Yates' car. So the toilet uh -huh. tissue, and whether, whether the victim brought the toilet tissue with him and left it in the car, or whether it was in the car and the victim ended up with some of it and then dropped it out here, I don't know. Um, number six, which is up here, is another ATM receipt that comes back to Mr. Gates. And number seven is the approximate location of the blood. So, um, and all of these are taken from starting at the, um, it was the southwest corner of the foundation of the house. So that's that white line down there. And then everything else is measured using the house as the baseline and then measured um, in a, either north or south of that baseline and then all of it is east of the baseline. So that's how the measurements are done. And um, I had all of these numbers placed and then I would pick up the evidence, um, leave the numbers there. I took photographs of everything so you could see. And then um, now the numbers are just um, marking the places where the stuff was. So as you can see from the measurements, you have your, your porch. You have your porch and you have, you don't, standing on the porch here, even on the very corner of the porch, you can't see the blood pool. So, you know, it's, and there was only this Do you have any questions about procedures or? How long does it take you to gather all that? Um, it depends. Now, it, on the, in this particular case, I came, I took pictures, I put my, um, my things down to mark the, but I left all the evidence. Um, and then I don't like to start picking stuff up until the detectives have seen the scene or have said, I don't need to see the scene. So um, I waited for quite some time and actually started doing measurements before um, I got word that Bake wasn't going to show up um, to, to view the scene. And so we went ahead and, and finished collecting. So um, generally, the thing that takes the longest is doing measurements. That's, it can be really, really hard. Um, yeah, I don't, it, back in those days, no. Um, and actually, I do have a laser thing, but I don't know how it would work outdoors. I know it's good for indoors, and, you know, frankly, I just haven't explored those options because usually if it's, if it's, a smallish scene. This is a fairly small scene, and it was fairly straightforward as far as measurements go because we had the house, and that gives you a nice straight line. Uh, we have had some giant outdoor scenes with people leading and walking around, and in that case, we usually get the highway patrol to come over with their total station, which is a GPS satellite thing. And so I will go ahead and put my markers down, make a log of what they represent, and then um, the highway patrol guys will come with their their satellite and then um, mark all of those, so that we can still reconstruct the scene if we have to. So how did you, oh, sorry. So how did you find 15 and 16? Just yeah, <laughs> that's this. That's my usual posture. In fact, you'll see newspaper pictures of me with my best <laughs> side forward. But it's dark as that part of you. It is. We have, days, but we know. have um, flashlights and stuff. Actually, all of this was located at night. Right. Um, and but as you can see from the pictures, we did return during the day um, for some follow-up stuff. But we, you need to really get all of your important evidence collected all at one time because once you release the crime scene, you can't go back again. And, and I mean, you can, but um, it's way open to, um, to question by the defense. I mean, anything could have happened with it. So we need to be really careful and get as much as we can the first time. I mean, it Blood spatter would be here, correct? We don't have that. So, <coughs> understanding that, and again, we know that 
he had to step off the porch, and I'll tell you how that's confirmed also. Okay, interviews. And we're going to talk about this case a little bit, and then Dean and I are going to expand just on the importance of interview and interrogation uh, at the ending, just not on this case, but because that's pretty intriguing, the mind game that, that we employ. So, nice. <laughs> uh, nice, yeah. I would say, you know, I do lots of cool things, but my absolute favorite part of my job is sitting in a room with someone who is bound and determined to lie to me and you can get them to tell you the truth. I mean, that, that's a real highlight. I mean, obviously, it takes takes some practice and some are better than others, and Dean's very good at it, and that's really, I like doing that. It's a real fun part of the job. But the interview with, with Mr. Yates is important. Oops. Okay. When Officer Sheeman arrives on the scene, Mr. Yates tells him, I heard a noise outside, I looked through the window, saw a kid breaking in my car, I yelled, hey, get out of there, he then ran. Now, he then makes a statement as he's being arrested, this is the second time my car has been broken into, and I'm getting tired of it. Those are key points that Officer Sheeman documented that are going to come into play huge in this case. Because... He makes these statements to the officer when he's stressed, he just been involved in a shooting, he's called his sister, which he didn't know at the time, coming to get his kids, he's upset, he has taken the police department, and then he's put in a room by himself for about an hour where he can sit there and think of the gravity of what he's done, and now he's going to have to come up with what? A story. So when someone makes a spontaneous utterance, you think it's more likely truthful or dishonest, usually? Truthful. truthful, because they're not thinking about it, they're just saying it. And so he says, I heard a noise outside, I looked through the window, I saw a kid breaking my car, I yelled, hey, get out of there, he then ran. What did he tell us after sitting in that room for an hour when we first interviewed him? He came at me, and I was scared for my life, and I shot him. Does he say that at all here? Now, we don't know that he told Sheeman this at the time because when we arrive, we get to the station, we're briefed by patrol, we go in, we take an initial statement from the suspect, then we go look at the scene, go check with the victim, strategize what we need to do now, uh, in this case, go back and confront him and do an interrogation. And so we know at the second point, before we go to that second interview, that he told Officer Sheeman that I said, get out of there. And this is unfortunate, really for Randy because did Randy do what he was told and he paid a death sentence for it. What's key here too is verbiage is very important in how we say things and you know we can detect deception in talking to people and we can also detect deception in written words. I can have you write a statement down and I can find where you're being deceptive in the way you write and things are very key in the way people talk. What is so key about these three little words in our English language? Very good. It shows a transfer of time, an elapsed part of time, right? He gave a statement. Did he see this kid run? Yes. And he makes this spontaneous utterance statement when he's being arrested. has nothing to do with him coming at me and nothing to do with self-defense. He then ran. That is huge because in his mind and him remembering it, he said something, he then saw something. Okay, And that does not jive at all with what he's trying to tell us when we talk to him. Is this important? What's his motive? He's not happy. And he's pissed, really, because it's happened to him. So, I don't know that it's important, but was this car actually broken into him or was it unlocked? Uh, it was unlocked. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the car that, yeah, it wasn't broken into him. Locked your car. Yeah. Locked your car. Good point, because most kids that are car hopping are just opportunists. Very rarely they break a window and take it. They're just checking cars, and if it's easy to get into, they do, and if they can't, they go on. If there's a light on, they usually go on. If it's dark and unlocked, that's just perfect for them. So. Where do you walk all that way, though, and then 
Uh, probably saw a stereo that he thought he could get. I assume that's probably what he did. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. Why didn't he go unlock the passenger side door and go around there? You know, I don't know if the dome, there was no dome behind the car, but the apes heard him outside. He heard he heard a noise and he went to look for it. Okay, so we first <coughs> ask him, what happened? We just let him tell us. So, Mr. Yates basically talks that he puts his daughter and son to bed. His daughter's 11, his son is 14. And the irony here is his son was arrested for breaking into cars about a year after this incident. <laughs> Unfortunately. But, uh, so he's checking out uh, the war on CNN. He's laying on the floor. He hears a noise. Thought it was the son going to the bathroom. But he doesn't see his son walk by and go into the bathroom. So that sparks his interest. And he gets his gun. So he obviously thought something was up. And that's another thing. Do you think, I mean, at the point he gets his gun, in his mind, has he made a decision that it's something serious enough that it's not in his house? Or, or what I should say, he needs to protect himself. Okay. Okay, now remember two different stories that he has to diverge here. Looks out the sliding glass door to the north, didn't see anything, walked to the front door, he heard a door, he opened the door, somebody's in a Zuzu, he says freeze, and this is transcribed word for word from our uh, audio recording. Okay. Anything unique about this statement here that you see? He doesn't say he pulled the trigger, he just said it. Very good. Who said that? Good job. That is huge. Doesn't mean that to most people, but I'll tell you something. You think a police officer describing a shooting in a coroner's inquest or after he'd been involved in a shooting, you think he's going to say, I initiated a traffic stop in the 2800 block of Brooks on a dark vehicle with tattooed windows I couldn't see in it. As I exited my vehicle, I started to approach with my flashlight in my left hand. The driver's door opened and I saw a male step out and he immediately pulled and took a aim at me with a gun. I drew my gun and my gun went off. <laughs> What's he going to say? Shot him. I shot him because that is true action. This is a sub subconscious statement and it's common when you're talking to people. He is putting the blame on an inanimate object. He's not accepting it for himself. And he didn't realize he said that, but it's just how he's talking and he's describing. But that's something you, fairly, you see fairly common. Okay, so in between the two interviews, he says he wants to call his sister and check on his kids, and we asked him to bring his, have his sister bring his kid down so we can do GSR on their hands too to make sure that they were involved in the shooting. He's in the room, it's being recorded, he's told that, and this is a phone conversation he makes to his sister. This is after he told us that he was scared and he needed a gun to protect himself. Was he scared or was he angry? Has he accepted responsibility for what he's done? He's put it on who? He's kid. He's still mad that this kid did this, even though he put his game face on to us and was saying how scared he was and how fearful he was. Now think about this. If I'm armed with a gun and I look out my door and I see somebody in my car and my kids are behind me in the house and I have a cell phone and I'm scared, why would I open the door and go outside to confront this person? Is that reasonable? The door is locked, I have a cell phone, I have a gun to protect myself, and I can call, and even though I'm standing this close, he's not aware I'm there, and I can report it. So, does his actions going out and confronting, not that the law doesn't allow you to provide that, but does that more consist with someone who's scared, or someone who's mad? Okay. In trial, he tried to make him bigger than he was. This kid was tiny. In fact, I thought he was like a seventh or eighth grader. He was uh, five foot seven and 126 pounds. And we couldn't figure out who he was. He had no ID on him. And so we asked all the school resource officers to check for kids that were absent from school um, who matched his description. And by noon, we still couldn't figure out who he was. And no one had reported him missing. 
and he was still in ICU on life support. And it was about 4 o'clock that afternoon when kind of word got around and someone contacted uh, his aunt and his mother, a probation officer actually, who heard the description and knew that he wasn't in school and that's how we eventually determined who he was. But anyway, he tells us he's 16, 17, 18, he's a kid, he's not a man, not like his, you know, because again, Mr. Yates is bigger than average size and here's a male who's small, because again, the law provides that you can use any force necessary to protect yourself, but no greater force. That make sense? So I mean, I can punch you, and if you knock down, hit your head, and you die later, but I was justified in the punch, that'll be okay. If I punch you and now kick you in the head, that's not, because you can see that's punitive. So any force necessary, but no greater force, but you can't go to lethal force or extreme force if you could use less force, okay? Simple question, right? <laughs> Interesting here. <laughs> Why do you think he's saying this? Trying to set up the self-defense. Because he's lying and he is very stressed right now. And think about it. If I ask you a question, how you got ready for work today, I could ask you five different times and you tell me the same story, the same truth. And I could come back five minutes later and say, now tell me again. So you got in the shower and then what you do? You tell me. And how did you drive to work? You tell me. Now if you're lying about something and our brain can only process, and I can't remember what the psychological term is, but seven different things at the most that the average person only can go about four or five before they start to get freezed up. And so if I know the truth, and I'm thinking of my lie, and I'm talking to you, there's three things right now, and then when we have people reenact things, now there's a fourth thing going on, my brain is trying to function, and I'm trying to keep up with this lie, and usually if I'm, a lie, if I'm lying, I need to think what my next lie is going to be in response to your question. So if you're stressed, that's going to exemplify that. And if you're telling the truth and not stressed, that shouldn't cause any drama for you, right? Now, can people be talking to the police and be stressed and be innocent? Mm -hmm. All the time. And I don't see that. And my wife, you know, she said, you got an antenna. Because to me, if the chief said, there's a pound of coke missing from the evidence locker and I want to talk to you about it. If I didn't do it, I'd, I wouldn't, I'd go talk to him. It wouldn't cause me stress. I'm innocent. But I forget, because I'm part of the system, that people are mistrusting of the system and that the average person can be innocent and because the police are talking to you, you would show signs of stress, not necessarily deception, but stress. And so that comes into play too. But the thing is, he's getting the story mixed up. Because the kid was never in his house, and he never said that, but he's compounding his lies, and he's now starting to screw up. This is huge. How many seconds did he have the gun on him? We already talked about two seconds being a lot. This is his own words. Think about that. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000, 4 1,000 to tell if someone is coming at you from five feet away or moving away from you. That's a ton of time, isn't it? Okay? He finally says yes Oops. later in the interview, and it's about the 14th time, I think it was the 13th or 14th time we asked him, so what is, is there any defense attorneys in here? What does his defense attorney say? Jesus, you wouldn't take his answer the first dozen times, he finally just told you what you wanted to hear. But do you think a person who's committed to a lie, do they have to be broke down a little bit to give it up? And do you think we beat confessions out of people? It's a home. You've got to be empathetic and understanding and compassionate and give them a reason and be there for them. I mean, obviously, we want to find the truth, and we're not just there to throw people in cages. We're there to help people, too, but at the same time, you know, being threatening towards somebody. I mean, you can, I'm sure you could, uh, you could do things to people who make them talk, because obviously torture will make people tell lies even to stop the pain. So obviously, civilian police don't do that stuff, but you're not going to get to it, but God damn, tell me what happened, you know. So there's there's things that we do, and like I said, being empathetic with them and understanding, and even when you got somebody who's raped a two-year-old baby, and you got to be understanding and, and sit and face them and not look with disgust in your face like you're judging them. When did Sam ask for an attorney, or when did he first? Never, never did. Never did. Yep. Okay. So. Yeah. Do you have a time limit for how long you can keep? Uh, no, but if it came up, uh, one of Dean's homicides that we worked, it came up as to how long we talked to the guy for like six hours. 
uh, and was he fed, and we'll, we'll, Dean can talk about that when he gets up here in just a few minutes, but uh, that will come into play, but there is no time that we have to stop. But if a person asks for an attorney at any given time, even after they start talking, then you stop. Okay, this is going to be key here. We show, showed you what the ballistic and blood evidence showed, the location of the body. He eventually admits that he was running away. So then we say, Sam, how about we go back to your house, and I'm going to videotape, and I just want you to walk me through the events of what happened so we can see it from you, your point of view. Is that a good thing to do from his point of view? So we go to his house. I have you take where he starts, where he's saying he's sleeping, so we can see it. It's not just, you know, for a jury later. They know where he's sleeping. He hears a noise. Walk down the hall behind him. He looks out the kitchen. There's the kitchen. Goes to the door. What's his view is out the door. He opens the door. He's on the step. Let me switch here. So what are you saying to him? He still maintaining that he came at him. He, you know, he says he ran away eventually, but at this point, and so he's saying, and it's real simple. We're asking, so what? did he do when he came at you? And instead of saying, well, he turned to his right, and as he came at me, he just came at me, and well, where are his hands? Uh, his hands were up. That would be a reasonable response, right? So he's like, well, he, I think he dropped his right foot, and then he took a step back, and as he, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if he stepped there like that, um, but at some point, he was like this. Yeah, he was like that, and what's he doing? Did he see the kid when he yelled at him, take that step out of the car? Kid can't run east, the car's there. Can't run north because the door's open. Dude with guns west, his only outlet is south. And so he's in the car. More than likely, he does this and he flees. And he's confusing what he saw as he's trying to lie to us verbally. And he's, he's saying this and he's talking. And he goes, and as he came at me and the gun went off. And what did I just do? <laughs> Stepped off the porch. Because you know what? In his brain, did he just do what he did before? Exactly. And that was key because he's lying, he's trying to keep his lie going, he's verbalizing, now he's moving, it's overload to his brain, and he now makes a mistake that he doesn't try to conceal from us. And right there on video, it's like, so he did step off the porch, um, Sam, and he sat there, and he went just like this. I must have. I mean, for that 10 to 12 seconds is about what it was. I mean, it's hard to, because, I mean, he realized. I mean, the things are collapsing down on him, the story's not working. So what's key here to prove all this, to corroborate the important thing, is a forensic thing. This weapon stopped the buzzing gunshot powder. What? Oh. Do you guys even think that the um, kid knew that he had a gun? Because he never said that he told him, I've got a gun on you. Yeah, I don't know. I know. I mean, I don't know. I think the kid probably just ran. I don't think there was any dialogue between them. I think he heard a noise and he tried to run the only direction he could. And, you know, he, he chose to go right as opposed to left, which is pretty common for most people to go right. It has something to do with our brain and being right handed. Um, not absolute, but it happens to be a person. Not that it particularly matters, but do you think that in this guy's mind, he really thought in, that he was right? No, because remember. He, he's lying because he said, I, I hollered freeze, he then ran. He didn't mention that at all to us. And if that uh, patrol officer wouldn't document it, it would have been huge because now he's, he's forgot he said that because of the spontaneous utterance, he's under a lot of stress, and now he's just telling us how he's going to try to justify it, but he can't understand, he doesn't know about blood spatter evidence, he doesn't know about ballistics, and he's trying to say an interaction between him and the victim that will be justified by use of force in his part. I, Sam Yates knows what he did was wrong. Because um, when I got on the stand and I testified to all this, when I got off the stand, he was still friendly to me. If you were innocent and a detective got on the stand and laid it out and he was lying, wouldn't you be a little mad because you're being railroaded? If he's still friendly to me, he was friendly to me that night, he was friendly to me in trial, and after I testified and laid all this out, he was still friendly to me because, I mean, you know, that's, that's the truth. Does that make sense to you? Um, this is what's telling, and this is what's huge in this case. This gun stopped <coughs> depositing gunshot powder at 42 inches. How do they do that? They take a gun, they fire it at one foot. There's gunshot residue. Two feet, gunshot residue. Three feet, gunshot residue. Four feet, no gunshot residue. One inch back, fire it, no gunshot residue. 
One inch back, no gunshot residue. One inch back, gunshot residue. So that gun, in this example, would deposit at three feet nine inches, but not three feet ten inches. So this gun deposited gunshot residue to a distance of 42 inches. That's the max. Didn't go 43 inches. Chemical processing of the victim's clothes revealed no gunshot residue. So that gun could not have been any closer than 42 inches. That's the closest it could have been. It could have been greater, but it couldn't have been any closer than that. GSR only shows one single particulate on the east side of that house, and one single particulate is not conclusive. It's, it's insufficient evidence. But the only GSR found anywhere is on the east side of the house. Remember, he's to the west of that southeast corner. But Mr. Yates stepping off that porch and pointing the gun at that angle, he's aiming the gun more at the corner of the house. But that, that's inconclusive. GSR, nothing found on Yates' hand, but this is what's telling. Yates' arm, from his armpit to his palm of his hand, now you can pull the gun, 21 inches. Barrel uh, to the length of the gun, 11 inches. And the gun doesn't deposit gunshot residue greater than 42 inches. And this is what's huge. Because evidence proves that it's 74 inches, which is how far? 6 feet 2 inches, which is about from me to Rick, right? About that. So the gun could not have been any closer than this distance, and he's running away from me and shot in the back of the head. He could have been greater than that, but he couldn't have been any closer than that. Is that someone coming at you? Is that justifiable use of force? So. And that's the huge thing. Yeah, we have the statements. Yeah, we have the ballistic evidence. Yeah, we have the blood uh, evidence. But this is telling because it really shows that they could not have been any closer than six feet. And their position to each other at six feet is, he's the shooter, I'm in this position, and I'm shot in the back of the head. There's absolutely no way I could be a threat to you. Okay? So, Randy Brown, just a Joe Average kid, some people say, you know, he shouldn't have been breaking into cars. He, that's what he should have gotten. And I can't believe when I hear people say that, because every one of us that has kids, you know, you can say, well, he's a thief. But you know what? Kids make mistakes. He didn't need to pay the death sentence for a misdemeanor theft. And if any one of our kids stole a pumpkin on Halloween and somebody gunned him down in, in the front yard, we'd be a little mad about that. So um, this would be a good average citizen. However, you're going to be held accountable in our society. He killed somebody took a grandson, a brother, a son, who's no longer here. You're not going to have that future. So, I mean, in my mind, five, six, seven years is not enough for killing somebody. What is? Should I think Mr. Yates should go to prison for the rest of his life? No. But I think he, in my opinion, 15, 20 years of your life, a 30-year life, a quarter of your life, that would be probably reasonable for that big of a choice. Is that like first degree? Murder? It was mitigated deliberate homicide. I mean, there's mitigated <coughs> factors, but it was a deliberate act. One question back there? I just wanted to know his sentences. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we don't have any influence on that. The judge does that. When you're sleep deprived, what do you have to be careful not to miss when you enter, the, you know, start into the, the scene or the investigation? What do you care? I'm sure your situational awareness, you got to think, hey, I haven't been sleeping, so I've heard, I've been up for a long shift. i got to be careful not to do something. Well, sleep deprived <laughs> or not, obviously, you know, when you, you kind of strategize is how you're going to handle this before you start going in. I mean, you take a look around, look at things, see if there's similarities or, or things that are right off the get-go or are obviously different than what the person's told you or things that are suspicious. Then you kind of, kind of put yourself <coughs> from their point of view and then kind of have a plan as to how you're going to approach this crime scene. One of the old detectives that uh, kind of talked guy and I, uh, who actually worked on this case, his, his comment on something like that was, a homicide is nothing more than somebody got assaulted. Don't think of it any bigger than that, because if you go to it, and when we're investigators and we try to think about that and we let that overwhelm you, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to move too fast, you're not going to, you're going to forget to do certain things. But any big case like this, is it's not just Guy, it's not, even though Guy did a great job in this case, I mean, there's a handful of people that are involved and everybody shares those ideas, and we all kind of plan it as a group, and then we attack that scene, and we do what we got to do, and everybody has assignments, and we all disperse out, and we do things. So the, the experience helps a ton, I've noticed, after being there a while. That first year you're there, you know, you're still a little nervous, and then once you get there and you start doing a, done, done a few of these homicides, and they start coming to you, 
and you start, you remember what you're going to need for trial. Because that's the biggest thing that I learned doing interviews, doing crime scene preparation was when you go to a trial, it's totally different. Like, unfortunately for you guys, even as if you're ever on a jury, you don't get to see all the stuff that happens behind the scenes, all the stuff that is let in, the stuff that they won't let you have, the things that you might have done wrong, the things that they're trying to uh, have suppressed, their confessions, all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And so when you actually experience that case as lead investigator, you sit with the prosecution team, and they go over that with you, and you get to watch all that. So then next time when I get a homicide, I know, okay, i got to watch out for this. I remember this happened last time. got to do this. And it totally just experience really builds that up, and you want that in your detective division. Some places think, you know, you should rotate out every two years. We try to keep a court group and then have other new people come in and out. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> the group will be seeing a voir dire exercise this afternoon based on these facts. Do the prosecutors who are um, in the county attorney's office work with you on what they would like you to do or not do? They're pretty good about communicating, especially on the bigger cases like this. Obviously, they've got a huge caseload just like we do, and so they've got a lot of responsibilities other than just the one case. But when they get a homicide like this, they try to accommodate that prosecutor and then they try to focus solely on that. And they've got some interns and stuff there that help, but, but do they would work as a team. Do they do training for you, not on any particular case, but just generically? No, not really. We've done some law updates and things like that, but no, they don't really sit down and train us at all. Well, gee, if you mind, they're prosecutors, we're investigators. They're not investigators, so they rely on what we bring to the table. Just like Barb, she does all the crime scene processing. They rely, we rely on her to do that. We rely on them and work with them for a successful prosecution. But they don't tell us what to do. I just meant in terms of inadmissible evidence that you referred to or that the other side got out in suggesting what became a problem in this case and how to avoid it subsequently. There's a lot of OJT. Yeah. <laughs> you don't learn this stuff in the academy. You know, you learn the face. There is no problem with this case. He was just saying sometimes. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, when you are doing the interviews, how do you decide how long you have them sit in there by themselves and sort of stew over what they're going to come up with? Do you have like kind of a, a template, this is what we do, or? It's kind of a case by case basis. This depends on how that person's responding to you and, and other things that we're doing. There's a lot of times we've had people sit in there for a half an hour you know, or maybe an hour because we can't get to them yet. And so, but we know they're being watched, we know they're being videotaped the whole time, they know that. And so, but like in Guy's case, we made the phone call, that happens quite a bit. So that's very helpful to us. So what would have made a difference um, for him in his case if you would have just said, you know, started running away and shot him in the back of the head? Would, would the sentencing, the whole bit been well, different? with a tongue-in-cheek, if he would have cooperated, would he get a better sentence? I mean, he already got 40 years of 20 suspended, so... Um, I, yeah, we try to tell people that's one incentive that, hey, you know, we all make mistakes. We'll help you through this, but you know what? Be honest, accept responsibility. We can present you to a prosecutor in that light. It's important why you did this, and we want to know that. I mean, we can't change what happened in the past, but we want to help you through this. So people that are honest and are forthright, yeah, hopefully the prosecutor and a judge ultimately will take that into consideration, because that's one of the things that we try to tell them is just the right thing to do. And then hopefully, obviously, if they lie and we have to disprove it, then that's taken into consideration, too. There's a lot of factors. I mean, the criminal history, you know, all that kind of stuff all comes into that sentencing part of it down the road. And that's when the attorneys, we don't get argued that, but the county attorneys will argue that, and their attorney will argue that for them, saying, you know, they're not in danger, and they'll <coughs> to the judge, and then they'll make that decision. Yeah, in this case, he, his attorney did, just wanted to have 20 years probation, not go to prison at all. But, but, he was not a threat to the community, and he's a father, has to take care of his kids, and probably valid points, but again, we have to have rules in our society for people to comply, and that was more the case in sentencing here. So what would have happened with the exact same, everything that happened, that when you found uh, Randy, he had a gun, like in his waistband? Okay. Well, that would set up a whole bunch of different things for you. <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 just more investigation. But my point is, is that, that he didn't, you know, the gun's there. He didn't have time to do anything. Uh, Sam was not, you know, didn't see the gun. But there was, you know, I guess it... Let's say it was in his waistband, but, gun, but Sam never saw it. That would be different than if Sam said, and he was reaching for his 
his waistband, and I saw something black come out as he was moving away from me, and I shot him, and there's a gun on the ground, and there's a kid shot, that would change it drastically, you know what I mean? Because he's, he's, got that self -defense law that he's, he's articulating that to yeah. us, yeah. So, that's a good point. So, once Sam gets out of prison, or all, even just like with a felony, any kind of felony, well, he won't ever be able to have a gun, right? Not anymore, that used to be the case, but... In Montana, once you discharge your sentence, if you're convicted of a felony in Montana, you discharge your sentence, Montana does give your gun rights back, but most other states don't. For some guys, you get around and carry black powder rifle because that doesn't fit the statute. <laughs> That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, that might. You said that his son, Ryan, was um, later caught breaking into cars. Did he make any comment on that? I didn't work the case. I just saw that he got, he was went through when we have our briefing. I saw that his son was arrested for breaking the car. If you would have invoked his rights during the interrogation, how would he have affected the case? Is this for you? I mean, that's... Let's say he never talked to us yeah. at all, and we only had a statement that he made the patrol officer that I said, hey, get out of there. He then ran, and then we proved that he still shot him from the back of the head at least six feet, two inches away. I still think that it would have stood on so I mean, that's tough. I mean, if I'm moving away from you from six feet away, I mean, if, I, I don't see any possible way you can say I'm a threat to you. And that's different than if I'm real close and I turn at the last second and I drop right there, that's something, but you know, that's not what happened. So when you look at the whole thing, um, he, he didn't really confess to us. He lied to us, and we had to prove the case with evidence. And so if he would have made no statement, we still would have proved the case. And there's a flip side to that, I'm sorry, just one more second, because like what Bart does and what we do with the crime scene, that's very important for the case. But then also on the other side, the interview part is so important because you can lose that evidence for whatever reason. And that's that backdoor stuff I was telling you about. So when you do lose it, and then you have no confession and you have no evidence, how do you prosecute that? Where then if you are able to get an interview and get a confession, you can keep that case flowing and it keeps going. It's very important to get that if you can. So you got to be very persistent. You got to, you know, you say you're talking sleep deprived when you're interviewing somebody for five or six hours, and it's a long, drawn out. You're really battling wits with them back and forth, and it's very fluid. It moves around all the time. You're you're wiped out by the time you get done. And it's you just want to marathon. You get home, and you just want to fall asleep. So, when you were um, interviewing him or interrogating him, did you know at that point in time that? that all the dots weren't matching up? Or did you have to look at the, put it all together at, at a later okay. date and say, oh, this is well, the years? We first interviewed him, we got the information from him. Then we went to the crime scene, talked to the patrol officer more, saw the victim's injuries, then it was going back to him to confront him. But, but at that point you knew that there were major inconsistencies? He didn't have injuries to the front of him, knew that where he was found was not consistent where he claimed the shooting had occurred, and... Um, that he had assumed that he was not happy about his car getting broken through. So, yeah. yes, ma'am. At what point was he charged when he was taken? And yeah, he was arrested that night and then charged right that okay. night. Yeah. Um, we can uh, not take anything away from Dean because uh, we want to talk a little bit about yeah, interview. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> but <laughs> it, Dean talked a little bit about just overview of interviewing. If you have some questions about that too, not specific to this case. But one thing, uh, what's that little bit? Oh, Scott Hoffman. He wanted me to point out that uh, the reason we can talk about this stuff is the guy had permission from the victim's family. And once it's adjudicated through the system, it's public information. We can talk about it. And just kind of as a courtesy to the family, saying, hey, we're going to be talking to people about this. We don't want this to happen to somebody again. They gave him that permission to do that. So we can't come up and tell you about all the cases because we don't have permission to do that. But this is one that, you know, guy thought was very important that he was able to get out to you guys. So. His, his grandma was real happy when I asked her if I could use this as an example of someone who died unjustifiably, you know, she thought that that kept his memory going, and, and so she was happy about doing that, so. So anything that was there, shot in the back of the head is not kind of a, indicated that they're not attacking you? Wouldn't that have just been kind of a, well, that's a huge like the very beginning? Yeah. Well, I mean, but you touched on that as well. I mean, there's been studies where law enforcement has been accused of shooting somebody in the back, and they've done these studies how fast it takes somebody to turn around with a bullet to get there when they were facing them at certain distances. And it'll show I me. Mean, it'll look like they were shot in the back, but they were truly facing the they were a threat. So I mean, not always, but I mean, there's those. Yeah, and that's out. that's why ballistic and blood evidence come in the key because if right now I do this, I mean, it's going to be right here. I'm going to drop. I'm not going to be over where Dean is, you know, like in this case. So 
I mean, this one clearly showed he's moving away, back to him, shot in the head. So, but there are cases of what, what he's saying too is just because you shot in the back of the head doesn't mean it could be justified. When you made the phone call to his sister, is that legal to record that, and is it admissible evidence? It is because we they, they know the room's being recorded audio and video at that time. And so they, they're told that. And so anything they do in there, they know. So a lot of times when defense attorneys come in and we want to do interviews with them, with their client, they'll always say, can we step outside? And they'll leave the room, go to the hallway, and then they'll come back in because they know that's admissible. So he's in custody at that point. He's not free to go. And what is your expectation of privacy in an interview room in the police department? So that's where that falls into why we can report it. Because for Miranda, when, when somebody waves a Miranda right, there's only two requirements. I know everybody sees on TV or they hear, they never remember, read me my Miranda rights. You don't have to. There's only two reasons why you have to. Both of these circumstances have to be met. Either one, the person does not feel, the reasonable person feel they're free to go. So they could be sitting in the back of a patrol car. They could be sitting in their front porch. They could be sitting in the police department. If that person reasonably felt they were not free to go, and you're asking them interrogative questions that could be self-incriminating, if you have those two elements, you have to read them their rights. If you don't, if they feel like, hey, I was okay, I was sitting on my couch, we were just talking, but yeah, he asked me if I killed somebody, you're still okay, you don't have to read them their rights because they're free to go. If I call you on the phone and I talk to you about a crime you committed, I don't have to read you your rights because you can hang up on me at any time. So it's it's very important to know. So. Once you read somebody their rights, do you have to arrest them? No. No. Um, only if they confess. They didn't get proofs that they did. <laughs> Reasonable, anyway, particularly on suspicion. And a lot of people think from TV that when you're arrested, you get your rights read to you. That's not. You could be arrested and never have your rights read to you if the officer doesn't need to talk to you. Let's say an officer comes around this corner and sees two guys fighting in the street, arrests both of them for disorderly conduct, never questions them, they go to jail, and you're in jail for disorderly conduct. I mean, you shouldn't do that. I mean, not all two guys fighting are willing combatants. Maybe one's being assaulted. So, I mean, you should talk to them. What I'm saying is just because you're arrested doesn't mean your rights to be read to you. And the police can talk to you about other things that just aren't incriminating about your case. So, I mean, they're asking you where you live, particulars, you know, other things that would have to read your rights if it's not accusatory or incriminating. So, do you guys ever watch CSI or? Do you ever watch ED or? Oh, yeah, GQ or the family needs it because I'm like, that is so not right. Yeah. You know, there's some of them I think. Yeah. The first 48 is a good one. That says, you know, they actually have. Real detectives out there in the homicide scene. And that first 48 hours is very important, which is very true. Uh, those are good shows to, to watch. Um, my wife makes me watch Dateline all the time. 48 hours, it comes out. But, um, I don't know if she's trying to kill me or thinks I'm trying to kill her. <laughs> <laughs> no, CSI, I didn't mean to drive me crazy. What kinds of questions do you ask? Do you have questions you can't ask? I mean, in other words, are there directions? And I guess. You know, as you're training, if you're training somebody to, to do your job at some point, do you have this course that says, you know, kind of here's how you proceed, or you just sort of shoot from the hip on it? Well, there's a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of interview training out there from different companies, different people, different perspectives. Um, and you just, what I like to always say is I take those and I put them in a toolbox, and whenever I need that certain tool, I'll take it out when I'm doing my interview and I'll use that. So a lot of defense attorneys have tried to say, you know, you're using the read method and this is how it's done and you didn't do it. Well, no, that's part of what I use, but I'm also doing this. But interviews, like I said before, are very fluid. You gotta kind of, you're on a path, but they'll pull you off sometimes and you gotta get back on that path, but you gotta respond to that and keep moving around. And it's a, it's a chess game sometimes. And you just gotta outlast them. You know, constantly keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't like to leave and either they either invoke their rights and don't want to talk to me anymore, or they give me a confession. I don't like to leave until I got one of those two things. I don't like to leave it hanging. So. And obviously, you're watching people's behavior. People do 24 behavioral things that indicate deception, and we look for clusters of those. So if I'm talking to you about things, you have no stress, you're not showing any indicators, and then all of a sudden, you're showing indicators, and now you're not again, then we know you're being deceptive, possibly, likely, in that area. So, so as an example, yesterday we had a gal that was in a, we arrested in a drug deal yesterday, and it, we were two of us interviewing her, and every time she told a lie, 
she would look at me, because he would ask her a question, the other detective, she'd look at me, and I knew she was lying. And then she'd talk to him some more, and then when he asked her another tough question, she'd look at me and lie. And so right then, okay, well, she's going to lie every time she looks at me. Well, yeah, so I'll know when she's lying to him, because she's looking at me every time. And it was, because that's what she was doing. What are some of the other indicators besides the one you just mentioned? We, I mean, it's not a secret. I'm sure you go online and find a, a good one. If someone says, huh? Tell. If, someone, <laughs> <laughs> if someone says, huh, what, or repeats the question, it's a 70% likelihood the next thing out of their mouth is going to be deception. I swear to God. A qualified denial, that's another one. Why would somebody do that? I have a lot of money. Yeah, think about O.J. Simpson. Did he say, how do you plead? Did he say, not guilty? O.J. Simpson said, absolutely, positively, 100%, not guilty. And if there's a picture-perfect qualified denial, that was it. So, and you look for clustering. Not, not one or two by themselves, and, and you'll see them. And, you know, it, it's funny because we've done this so much. Him and I are a great team. Uh, we've done this so much that, I mean, people are, are doing these things, and it's just, boom. I mean, I see it. I watched when that Peterson dude was being interviewed on Dateline about Lacey or killing his wife, and I could tell that he was lying right there. I mean, I could tell when my 13-year-old doesn't walk the dog like he's supposed to be. Poor guy. <laughs> so, I, I can tell when they go by the dog. I'm just coming across the field. But that just becomes, I mean, you're just constantly reading people's body language, you know, buying cars, whatever, doing things like that. But, my wife's got a, she's a teacher and she's got a family human development part of psychology degree and with me I told her that our three little boys don't really have a chance. So sometimes I let them lie and get away with it. <laughs> it's funny because the five-year-old, the, the less intelligent a person is, usually the more exemplified it is. And so the five-year-old says things sometimes and I'll say, you know, I obviously get a parent and be honest, but I don't catch them all the time because I would catch them. It's just, you got to get away with something. <laughs> <laughs> do you always tandem um, interview or do you sometimes do solos or does it matter? Or? We try to do two people because a lot of times because of that fluidity and the way it moves, you do get off track. And so the other guy is there, the other detective, whatever, is man or woman, and they're trying to then take notes for you while you're asking questions. And you will pick up things as you're sitting in that chair listening. Because it's kind of a science. I mean, you can't, when the two of us are in the room interviewing somebody, we can't interrupt each other. Because one thing you want to show the person you're interviewing is you're in control of that situation. So if I'm asking a question, and then the person's trying to answer, and the guy jumps in and asks a random question, and then it throws me off, and then that person sitting there, you'll see it. You'll notice, you'll be like, who's in charge here? What's going on? And so we kind of put it down. One guy asks the questions, and then the other person, when they're done, they ask questions. And we wanted to do that because it gives me time to think about, okay, I forgot to ask this question, or I forgot to do this, or then I'm listening to what he's saying, and he's remembering things going. And that's why it's fun to work with Guy, because we do think a lot the same when we're interviewing people. That's about the only time we think the same. <laughs> but, I'm just kidding, he's a friend. But um, when we're doing that, if I miss it, I know he's going to know it, and he's going to ask the question, and vice versa. If he misses a line of questions, he knows I'm going to ask it. So then by the time we get done, I think it's pretty solid by the time we get done with it. And you take a break after the interview and we talk, and what do you think about this? Well, he said that, and yeah, he didn't say this, and did you notice when he did this? So when you go back in to do a confrontation, and you can tell the difference between the, interview and the, or the interrogation, um, then we can kind of get a plan and go. So. Have you ever had the situation where evidence really points to one person, and then you've had interviews, and you're just like, no, they're innocent? I don't think we have. Um, if we had more time, there was a case out of Virginia in which three guys confessed to a murder and a rape they didn't do, and DNA exonerated them later, and it's always found that very intriguing. How the hell, uh, the third guy involved, but two of them who were not involved, did not do it, and they confessed to it, and one certain life sentence to this day, and their DNA didn't match at the time, at least alone. That's why Dean and I, I'd rather let 99 guilty people go than Dick one innocent person. Um, that's my philosophy. So, I mean, if I don't think Which it's... Which is the thing, uh... Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> and you weren't lying. We didn't see any of those indicators. So. <laughs> we want to look for the, everything, and then we, you know, sometimes you know a person's guilty, but you can't prove it, and we can't charge them because you got to have a case that's provable beyond a reasonable doubt. You just need probable cause to arrest a person, but you need proof beyond a reasonable doubt to find a person guilty in court, and that's usually a huge distance, you know. You were talking about empathizing with the suspect. Do you both take on that empathizing role, or do you try to? Yeah, no, there's not good stuff. Good stuff. Do you think it'd be good or bad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I that, 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 that is a tough one. A friend of mine asked me that the other day. He says, how do you talk to people who kill their own babies? How do you talk to people that rape people? And how, how do you do that and go home and deal with what, what you see all day? And how do you go home and go home and take your dog and drink a bottle of booze or something? But you have to get in their mind. And you, if, you, if I come off or a guy comes off, the detective, whoever comes off is offended and mad at what they did, they're, they're, you're not going to talk to them. So you got to pretend during that time yeah, I can understand why, well, yeah, that six-year-old girl, I can see how she would have been coming on to you. You know, and, you know I've seen that before. And, yet, you know, you got to get into this role and you got to play like an actor to get what you want. So I'm just, you know, if your wife wants you to go for a walk down the river trail and you want to go watch football game, she's going to talk you into it and you're like, okay, honey, I'd love to go. But she's really like, God, I wish I could stay and watch the game. But she's not going to know that, right? She's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the vast majority of people we talk to, too, are good people good average people that made an error in judgment or a mistake. They're not bad people. And that's the majority of people we deal with are people like us that just made a mistake. So, For those people that you don't, um, that are not good people, do you guys ever feel threatened in your daily life or your families or anything about living here? I've only had one guy come up to me in a restaurant and challenge me with when my family was there. That didn't work out very good for him. But um, no, I think I really, guy knows a lot of people. He knows more people than I do. He always remembers them. I always forget everybody. But um, he, uh, I don't think you've had issues with people in that game. I just had one person say something once, and we had a talk, and we're done. So. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty good about that. I mean, the Wicked community is pretty good. It is small, though. You can see them all the time. And we do that in interviews. We try to tell them that. You know, we're going to bump into each other in the mall. We're going to bump into each other downtown. I want to be able to shake your hand. And, and I mean, guys, are, we're, we're nice to them, and they're people. They make mistakes. And we try to express that when we're doing the interview. Yeah, it helps get a confession sometimes because they think you're relating to them. But it is true. I mean, I, I want these people to get better. I don't want them to get worse. So, you ever share a meal with a suspect if it's a protracted interview to show that report? Sit there and eat a hamburger together? No, but I did buy them a McDonald's burger. They didn't plead not guilty. It made me really mad. <laughs> no, uh, I try. Some, everybody's kind of different with this. That's again that toolbox where some detectives or some agencies will bring food in, they'll bring water in. I mean, to me, I try not to do that because when your mouth is dry and you're fighting to get saliva in there, you're lying to me. And I can see those physical reactions. Um, no, I don't break bread with him. I buy him soda out of my pocket. I'll buy him a soda or water. He does too. I mean, well, he doesn't keep the soda in his pocket. He just buys <laughs> my money. I mean. Do you have a local polygraph technician, or if you need, do you ever employ that method? We actually did one not too long ago, but it wasn't us locally. The FBI was involved with us. We had a gentleman who enticed a 12-year-old across state lines and uh, had her for the weekend. And the FBI then, because because of that type of case, they came in and they did have a polygraph for Helena. The shot right over that day, and they did a very lengthy polygraph. But it's not admissible in the state of Montana for state courts, so. It's really not admissible in federal court either. It just gives you the confidence of re-interviewing them again when you point out the line. Yes, sir. I'm curious if you guys have seen any changes in the statistics over the last 10 years or anything more prevalent than the new in the last 10 years? I could say we're off the bat prescription drugs, but that's oh, just yeah, been similar. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. I've been doing that for the last 18 months. We had, uh, and it's when you see the commercials, I don't know if you've seen the Attorney General's commercials with the SC about yeah. prescription drugs. When they say over three hundred people in Montana are dying, it's a true stat. And we just we've probably had I don't know, four or five in the last couple of weeks, so overdosing on drugs. And so I've seen a huge rise of prescription drugs. I don't know if it's just because we're addressing the issue now and they've actually given me the opportunity to be a full time investigator for that. 
I'm probably the only local department investigator whose full-time task is prescription drugs because there's just no money, everybody's broke. And so it's good that we do that. And I'm Bob will attest because he signs them to me constantly. I've got a lot of cases. Uh, and uh, it's, just, it's a bad thing. But as far as like rapes, homicides, burglaries, robberies, I don't know. There's different times of year, like right before Christmas, we get a lot of robberies. I don't know if it's because of winter, they just want to buy Christmas presents, but we get a lot of robberies in the wintertime. It's kind of strange. And then they all die off during the summer, and then you start seeing them come back again. That's probably the only rise that I see. <coughs> Let's just go with one more question. So. Sure. There was, was there just legislation that was proposed or passed in the last, recently, this legislative, legislative session that dealt with the narcotics where they are allowing a, data, a database to be kept? That so if you fill a prescription for narcotics at Walgreens, Walmart, Osco, that now you can actually tie it together. Well, it hasn't gone through all the way yet. Okay, it's, now, the, it's PDR prescription drug registry, okay. and it's gotten onto the floor. I mean, it's gotten off the floor. It's been a committee. I think it's already had one. I think it's got one more reading or something. It passed the last time. I think 85 to 15, some number like that. So in 07 and 09, it didn't get through. So we're hoping this year it does. And it will do that. So if you go to Walgreens, fill a prescription for Lord's Ave, and then this guy wants to go down and do another one at Walmart, 10 minutes later, if the pharmacist punches it in, they see that they just filled that. And the doctors can use it too, but they have to go check it. It doesn't just automatically come up for them. And for law enforcement, we have access, but we have to do an investigative subpoena to get the information. So if somebody will tell us about it, then I'll have to get an investigative subpoena and we can look up all their filling records. And so we're only like one of five states that doesn't have it. And we, if we do, I think it's going to save some lives. So. We get reports back from our, to our clinics and our physicians, though, of, of multiple prescriptions um, that have been filled by the same patient. So there is a database that's there, so we can see if our patient's gone to three other providers and gotten the pain tests. And just so recently, we're back so you're aware. you guys have actually been sharing that information just in the last few months, so it's nice that we're networking that. And that's a lot of where my cases are coming from. So. And I would say that the bigger issue in my world in pediatrics is that actually kids are taking things out of their parents. So that I've seen far more suicide attempts and overdoses of them taking. So not even multiple drugs, but just going into mom and dad's you know, the, yeah. cabinets. And that, I will say that I've seen over the last couple years more of that as far as overdose or suicide attempts rather than the other methods that have... Yeah, see, we don't get a report on that, and I wanted to get with somebody, maybe you're the person to get with on that, is finding those stats for the ones who do go to the hospital that are 18 and under for that. They don't die, because we do have those stats for the deaths, but the actual people that actually go in because they're overdosed because of an accidental situation, because that would be very important for the PowerPoint that I do for prescription diversion. So. Dean does a very good presentation, and you guys are a cross-section of leaders in the community. If you need him to come to benefit your business, or for whatever reason, he does a very good prescription drug diversion uh, presentation. So, Are they two going to stick around a little bit so people can ask questions? Uh, yeah, let's we'll stick around for just a few. Would you do that? Yeah, for about 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mary. His wife is a teacher. I do not know Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he has three children, yep. including a wild child five-year-old. <laughs> so. And beyond that, he's a 19... Do you want me to read this or not? No. No, that's okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'll deal with that. Yeah, well, well, that's not what I gave Hoffman. You can read it earlier, so you can read it. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just tell you. Okay. All right. Because <laughs> I took my date. <laughs> experience, what we hear from others, and what we see, hear, or read in the media. And those are the three things that we have our opinions about everything that we know anything about. And is our perception always accurate? No. Nope. Yeah. So things could be differently and things could exist that we don't know. And I think when we talk about games today that you're going to be a little surprised. So this presentation, uh, we have an hour and a half to do. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Northwest Gang Investigators Association. I've been on the executive board of that for a long time, 12 years. <coughs> and we 
uh, our gang investigators from Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. There's probably 15 gang investigator associations around the country, and ours is in the Northwest. And so we provide training for law enforcement communities, uh, strategies, intervention, prevention, recognition, all that stuff. So I've done probably 220, maybe 240 presentations all over the Northwest, and this is the one I picked for you guys today. And this is understanding, um, under, <laughs> understanding the. What word is this in there? Street gangs. Street gangs. Huh? Street gangs. Street gangs. Street gangs. Go back. <laughs> no, I to guys see you said understanding the migration of street gangs into rural America. So we're not going to sit here for an hour to talk about gang activity in Missoula. We will get to that, but I want you to understand the big picture of gangs in America, how it is so pervasive, how Americans, as Americans, we are addicted to violence. We continually use violence as a solution. We're a very violent society and gangs are a vehicle that continue that along with the drug activity that, that is involved too. So I think uh, it's going to be fun and I bet you will be a little <coughs> amazed and astounded by some of the things you hear. Again, we'll keep it uh, casual if you have any questions, just ask when we're there. There's a video at the end that I'm going to show uh, that punctuates kind of the importance I'm telling you about the violence that we use to solve our issues and there's an incident in there that shows an actual shooting and uh, it's when a person is by an elevator and sometimes there's been some people that are upset by that so when you see the two people standing by the elevator if you don't want to see um, one of them get shot then just don't watch. But that'll be the last video there at the end. Okay? So, again, uh, we'll start. If you have any questions, let me know. We'll start off and see if uh, you recognize anybody here in this video. Now and then, you go to a movie now and then, but primarily you're at home in bed by about 9 or 10 o'clock, and you can leave those lights down. They'll let them sleep easier. Um, you're home 9 or 10 o'clock every night, and you are basing what you know that goes on in your community from what you'll tell So, a couple things here. Obviously, this is a part of our society that you are not a part of. This is a part of our society that is way bigger than I believe you know, and it's a part of society that permeates through the parts of society that you are involved in too. So, again, uh, since Hoffman didn't read all my bio, I sometimes I give you a handout. I didn't get this knowledge from working games in Missoula over the last 15, 16 years, and as part of NWGIA, I've traveled all over the country working with gang units from Long Beach, LA, LA County. I worked in Compton, uh, Century Station, East LA, as well as Spokane. Portland, Las Vegas, Houston, I've been all over the place. So a lot of that that we tried to implement what would work in Missoula, and so we didn't get to the point that we, we would never have gangs. We'll talk about that later. But let's look at gangs on a historical uh, perspective for America. You'll see here in the decade of the 70s, there were 201 U.S. cities that reported the presence of street gangs. During the decade of the 80s, 267 additional cities or a cumulative number of 468 U.S. cities reported the presence of street gangs. However, during just the first five years of the 90s, over 1,000 new U.S. cities reported the presence of street gangs. 1,019 cities that included Missoula and Billings and Great Falls and Idaho Falls and Nampa, Idaho and uh, Wenatchee, Washington. What do you think caused that? 201 cities in the 70s, 267, fairly consistent number during the next decade, mm -hmm. yet then a 400% increase in five years of the 90s. Rap music. And yeah. what do you mean by rap music? Well, it's just they um, made it, all these kids want to be rappers, <laughs> and it's just the rap music and the way they dress, and they made it cool okay. to all the younger kids. A couple things, if you think about hip-hop and rap, what is it? It's the voice of the inner city, it's the urban speak, if you will, it came uh, 1981, Rapper's Delight, Sugar Hill Gang out of uh, New York was the first rap group that had any, any exposure. <coughs> Before rap became mainstream, you had to live in these cities to get the message of rap. You had to be on the sidewalks to get the demo cassettes to listen to this. And then what happens in 1981 in America? MTV goes on live and it's broadcast from New York City and within a short period of time, rap is now mainstream, and it's got popularity to it. 
Did that have anything to do with this bike from 1995? Probably not so much. I'm looking for something different. And keep this in mind, too. Did gangs exist prior to 1970 in America? Yes. Very much so. If you look at the first gangs, the first ethnic gangs in the five point areas of New York, Irish gangs, immigrant gangs, in the late 1700s. So we are about 220, 225 years of gangs in America. The gangs of today, social, well, uh, consistent wise, you can look back to just after World War II, especially with the West Coast influence, you're going to see consistent with Hispanic and African American gangs today. Um, but again, what do you think caused that spike in the 90-95 period? The spin-offs. What? The spin-offs, the gangs. Law enforcement became more aware of gangs started breaking off into different sets. Immigration. Urban okay. sprawl and immigration. Okay, and Trust. how did that affect it? <clears throat> because as cities like rural, became more rural, like Spokane, and if people moved into different parts of the country, Okay, a couple different ideas. Law enforcement became more aware. I agree with that. We'll talk about that a little bit. Drug and then also pressure for law enforcement and breaking of sets. What were we going to say? I, I was thinking of this methamphetamine distribution. You're close, but not methamphetamine. And you're all okay. fairly close peripheral wise. Huh? Heroin. heroin. Not heroin. Crack. And crack cocaine. Crack cocaine is the catalyst that causes gangs to leave the hoods and the inner cities and move to middle and rural America. That was it in and of itself. The summer of 1980, crack cocaine comes on the scene, first scene in South Central Los Angeles, and it changed gangsters and everything <coughs> in America much, much for the worst. Now crack, does everyone know how to make crack? No, it's no. not a secret. We could make some right here if we had it. <laughs> Basically, to make crack cocaine, you take cocaine hydrochloride, or powdered cocaine, which is the way cocaine comes to us from the south, and that cocaine hydrochloride in its powdered form can be snorted. Now there's four ways to introduce a narcotic into our system. Ingestion, which you eat, and it breaks down into amino acids in your stomach and gets into your bloodstream through your liver and affects your brain, not very effective. You have inhalation, which is pretty effective because you're snorting and introducing right to your mucous membrane. Uh, you have Injection, which is very effective, if uh, depending on where you place it in your arm, between your toes, behind your knee, on an injectable narcotic, a healthy human circulatory rate is about one minute, so wherever you put it into your body, it'll be to your brain very quickly. And then you can have a fourth one that can be very effective or not so effective, which would be absorption or subcutaneous. So if you put a nicotine patch in your skin, very slow absorption, not that effective over quick, I mean, slow period of time, or if you were to uh, take LSD and put it on your eyeball or your tongue, it would be very quick, to, uh, very effective. So those four ways we introduce narcotics into our system. Powdered cocaine in that form is snorted, and so that has been abused in America since the 1940s. It's a stimulant, but due to the cost of it, about $125 to $150 a gram back in the day, um, it wasn't affordable to everyone. So it was kind of a middle <laughs> to upper class social drug. It wasn't a fiend drug like crack cocaine is and like meth is, and we'll talk about meth a little bit too. But to make crack cocaine, we'll take 50% and 50% cocaine and an additive. Now, not every white powdery substance has a molecular structure to glom to the cocaine molecule. So the common cutting agents are sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. You can also use laundry detergent, and you can also use baby laxative. So we're going to take... Say so we've got a kilo of cocaine, which is 1,000 grams or 2.2 pounds. Can't mix it in that amount. It's too big. But say we'll take 50 grams at a time. We have a glass jar or a beaker. We'll put 50 grams of coke in, 50 grams of sodium bicarbonate, put a little bit of ammonia in there, mix it up. We'll take that glass jar and put it into a pot of boiling water and let it boil for several minutes. That boiling process will liquefy the substance. And once it's liquefied, we're going to take it off the heat source and let it cool. If we put it in ice or we put it in the freezer, it will cool faster. But once it's cooled, you have rock cocaine. Now, that conversion process did two things. Number one, it theoretically removed the hydrochloric aspect of the cocaine, so now it's no longer water soluble. Okay? And secondly, it lowered the ignition point to the point that you can smoke with a butane lighter. So you'd have to have a very hot flame to vaporize powdered cocaine. Crack cocaine, you can smoke with a butane lighter easily. And the fact that it's no longer water-soluble, it's a very hardy drug. So 
How many of you or some of you remember being back in the 80s when gangsters were chewing on their pacifiers in the cities? That was a common street thing that they had product, and to this day they commonly will keep crack cocaine in their mouth because when the police come, you can swallow it. It's not water soluble, so it'll go through and you can come out the other end, throw in a pipe, and smoke it, and it will work that way. Not advisable. <laughs> when cocaine in its powdered form, if you were to have that in your mouth, it would affect your, because it would absorb into your tongue. So, uh, the second thing, or the other thing that made this huge is, we're going to talk about the effect of it on our body in just a minute, but it's important to understand the fact that crack cocaine was the catalyst. Now, you are not going to have gangs without drugs, and you are not going to have gangs without violence. So gangs may coexist for a bit, and as long as everyone's making their money, but someone's going to disrespect somebody, someone's going to step on somebody's toes, and you're going to have violence. You will never have gangs without drugs. You will never have gangs and drugs without violence. To what level communities want to tolerate, that's up to individual communities. We're going to talk about that too. But it's important to remember this. As this gentleman said, law enforcement was more aware. That probably has some influence here too, because if you remember, well, if you know, does anyone, well, I'll just tell you, between 1985 and 1989, youth violence skyrocketed in our country. Between 85 and 89, that five-year period, youth homicide rates rose 582 or 586%, almost 600% increase in five years, youth-related homicides. Now, traditionally, homicide has a high solvent rate. Why? Because 72, 73% of homicide victims know who kills them, and there's always a motive. Those homicides that are hard to solve are the ones when you can't prove a relationship between victim and suspect. So at the same time that youth homicide rates start to skyrocket in our country, solvent rates in our urban police departments and sheriff's departments drop correspondingly. Now at the time it wasn't recognized, but hindsight being 2020, there was a direct correlation. What was that? Homicide rates involving juveniles are skyrocketing, solvent rates are dropping. You had to shoot somebody to get in the gang and prove your loyalty. Kind of. Drive by shooting. You're on the money. What else? The fact that they didn't know each other. There's motive for drugs and disrespect and turf and gang dis issues and rivalries, but you had people killing each other that had no connection. Okay? So, <clears throat> homicide rates are dropping. Historically, homicide has a high solvent rate, higher than rape, higher than robbery, higher than burglary. Because it's the most serious crime, you probably put as much as you can into it, but there's always usually a connection. There's always a motive and usually a connection. But like I said, when you have strangers killing each other, they're more difficult to solve. Now, as gangsters start to push this crack cocaine in the early 80s, especially in the mid-80s, it starts really starting to leave Southern California, wherever they have a connect. Aurora, Colorado, Wichita, Kansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, wherever they have a relative, wherever they have some place to go, and they start to spread, and crack cocaine spreads across our country like a wildfire. And along with this crack cocaine starts a prevalence of violence that we have never seen prior to the 80s. And if you think about it, we are now two generations deep, two generations deep in the most violent youth that we've ever seen in America. Is it all gang violence? No. I mean, when you have, you know, you hear in the news, you got a 13-year-old kid that, that kills his mom and dad and then goes to school on the bus and you think, geez, you'll never hear anything worse than that. you got an 11-year-old kid who kills his dad and his dad's roommate because they wouldn't let him spend the night at a friend's house. And I mean, these acts of violence are, each time, you just think it can't be superseded. And we in America, if you think about it, are addicted to violence. We're addicted to violence from a very young age, and we always, or I shouldn't say always, we have usually resolved our differences with violence. We've been able to do that as a country on the world stage with our military. We've been able to take what we want in the history of America, and all that has just fed to the greatest country on earth and the most freedoms. So now we are looking, as I said, 30 years into the most violent criminal youth that we've ever seen. Now, gangs play a part into that, and they're the vehicle for this violence, but not exclusive to the violence. The drugs are in there too, we're going to talk about that. But the big thing here is, 
as law enforcement agencies start to respond to these gang issues in the late 80s, early 90s, they start to develop task forces and gang units. And like he said, law enforcement probably started to get a better understanding of what was going on in their jurisdiction. Also, what comes on the scene in the early 90s that really changed our lives? What runs the internet? Computers. So, prior to, we got computers in our department in 91, departments were getting them in the early 90s. Before you had computers, could you share information very easily? And now computers allow you to share intelligence. I mean, I can email, obviously, I can be on the street, take a picture of somebody, email it to somebody in Los Angeles, and they have it instantaneously. So computers have allowed law enforcement to work this highly mobile, highly violent uh, criminal elements in our country more effectively. So you have gang units who are focused on it, you have technology there, and you have them spreading across our country like a negative surge. Okay, so all of a sudden, cities between 90 and 95 that never had to deal with gangs, never even thought about the issue of gangs, are now having to deal with gangs. And they're not just dealing with non-resident gang affiliates, they're dealing with resident gang affiliates. Because, as she said, rap music maybe made it cool, but do you think gangs are glorified in America? They are. And I'll tell you this, I don't care if it's a high school that's 2,000, 200, or 120. You transplant a non-resident gang affiliate into any student body school anywhere in this country, and there are going to be kids in that school that are interested in him. Anyone disagree? The ultimate bad boy for a girl is a hardcore gangbanger. And then, you know, there's reasons why, why would local kids be interested in these types that are coming into our communities? So, crack cocaine, we talked about a highly addictive stimulant. Now, we talked about cocaine before not being very affordable. So that really comes into play here because crack, or cocaine in its rock form, crack, can be sold for $5 to $20 a rock. Now if we were at Wilshire and Normandy in LA right now, and we had 1,000 rocks, we'd make five grand because we'd be selling them for $5 a rock. Today in Great Falls, for example, they would sell for $20 a rock. Now what's the distance of travel time between Los Angeles and Great Falls on Interstate 15? Uh, 14, 15, 14 or 15 hours, right? If you're going to drive straight through. If you want to spend the night, it's an easy drive to Salt Lake, and then you continue the next day. Now, if you had a thousand rocks, and you're an HRA gangster crip out of Long Beach, and you're getting shot at, and you've got tons of competition, and the police are kicking your ass, and they're pretty good at what they do, and the community knows you're a threat, but you can get into a car, and tomorrow, be in rural Montana, and you're going to make a 400% profit margin, and no one's going to hard ass you, the police don't know how to deal with you, the community doesn't recognize you for the threat you are, you have no competition, and you're the big fish in the little pond, does that motivate you to leave? So now they can leave, and they're looking at a 400% profit margin in crack cocaine, and this is in the 80s, early 90s, we're going to talk about meth here in a minute, but that really pushed them to leave the cities. And so, to understand cocaine, what is homeostasis? Do you have any, any of you have any of them? What? We all do. Yep. Homeostasis is our body's ability to regulate. It's our body's norm. No influence of stimulants or depressants. Okay. So cocaine in its powdered form will get you high for about four hours, depending on the cut, and will get you high within minutes of doing it, and it'll sustain your high for probably about four or five hours. And remember, we talked about it being about 125 dollars a gram. Okay, back in the day in the 80s, early 90s, which was kind of relegated to the middle to upper class. Crack, on the other hand, gets you very high within seconds. And they quantify the high as being twice as high as powdered cocaine. The only thing is, it only lasts for about 30 minutes. Now, if you get high on crack, and you come down, do you stop right here at homeostasis? No, you come a little farther, then your body would regulate and you'd be good to go. Now, if you smoked it again, shortly thereafter, do you think you're going to come right back to this low point again? Or if you get high, you're going to come a little lower. And if you get high a third time, you're going to get a little lower. What is the physiological result of us continually deviating homeostasis? Addiction. Addiction. And crack cocaine is so addictive that you can be addicted in as little as three uses. Three uses can addict you to try. To crack. So now you wonder, well, how can some big city thug roll into middle America, your town America, and this take off? 
Kids are smarter than that. They heard just say no in fifth grade to dare, and they listen to mom and dad, and they're good kids, right? Well, I'll tell you this. Kids in Missoula, for example, at the schools, how many people have high school kids here? Okay, the kids here and just talking to them over the years will say that they think anywhere between one out of four and one out of five kids in Missoula smoke weed at least once a week. Do you guys agree or disagree with that? So, obviously at these parties, everybody's drinking. Lots of people are doing marijuana. And we'll say it's your town, America. And at this party, which is an average Friday night, where your son or daughter is at, and at this party, most people know everyone, but there's somebody there that they don't know. He rolled in from Spokane, or he's from Yakima, or he's from wherever. And at this party, he says, you know, man, weed's pretty sweet. Why don't you try some of this? And he's got a little white rock. Now, do you think every kid at that party is going to take a drug from a stranger? No. However, given the opportunity to... Five bucks. <laughs> Five bucks. <laughs> Um, given the opportunity to try a drug for free, do you think some kids will? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so here's somebody who is always smart enough never to do anything worse than weed, because weed doesn't hurt you, everybody's smoking weed, right? And we go back into a bedroom, we go into a bathroom out of the deck, and I put this glass pipe in your face, and I throw in that rock, and I light it, and within seconds, you have a high twice as high as powdered cocaine. And you've only ever smoked weed, and I don't even know you and I didn't make you pay me a penny. About a half hour later, you're coming down, and I say, yo, Holmes, what do you think of that? That was incredible. I said, come on, Let's go back in there, put that pipe in your face, light it up again, you smoke it up, you get high again. And we do that three or four times on average Friday night. And you were an average kid in an average town in America that was always smarter to never do anything worse than weed, and you're not a bad kid, you're an average kid. And now by midnight, you smoke crack four or five times, and it didn't cost you a penny. Is that a very wise business decision on my part? You see people giving blunts away at parties for free? That doesn't happen, right? So why am I giving you these rocks? Because if I can get you addicted, it's going to be very lucrative for me. So let's talk about this. Powdered cocaine, $150 a gram, compared to $10 a rock. Now, more kids today have $150 bucks in their pocket than they did 20 years ago, but does everybody have a 10 in their pocket? And kids can find 10s all day long, right? So, duration of effect, four to five hours, it's not a fiend drug. So, if you buy a gram of cocaine, you know, I'm a dealer and I sell you a gram of cocaine, I probably won't see you for about a week because it'll get you high. Eighth gram dosage is amount on a powdered substance. You get high about eight times off of a gram, and I won't see you for probably a week. But if, I, if you're buying 10 rocks per day for 10 customers, you can see that exponentially, 1500 a week selling cocaine is very good, but $1,000 a day with 10 customers with a 10 rock habit is 400% profit margin. Now, are those a profit number? No, with every good business, you have overhead and some cost. But the thing here is, a highly addictive stimulant was created and trafficked by gangs because there's mega money to be made. That's why the violence follows it, and that's why they have spread across the country. Okay? Everybody can afford the stimulant, it's highly addictive, and it just starts to wreck the social fabric of America. Where you get crack cocaine in the community, you will never get rid of it. Once gangs become entrenched in your community, you will never get rid of them either. So trying to deal with them before there is a problematic level is the key here. So, let's look at the gang distribution today. We'll speed up a few years, and we're going to look at the National Drug Intelligence Center does yearly studies, they do quarterly studies, all types of studies, drug distribution, drug trends in America, nationwide, region-wide, statewide. And in 2003, they commissioned a study to see what influence street gangs and outlaw motorcycle gangs have on drug, drug distribution in our country. So 3,300 law enforcement agencies, city, county, state, provided information to NDIC about this, and in 2004, they published these results. This first tab is meth, marriage of Manhuna, cocaine, and crack that I put on here. The Pacific Northwest includes Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, but it also includes California. So that's the region we are in, obviously California, most populated state, big time drug use is going to affect the numbers. But the numbers, as you can see here, 
are these. Three quarters of all meth distribution in our region has a gang influence. Two thirds of all marijuana distribution has a gang influence. And over 50% of the cocaine and crack cocaine distribution has a gang influence. So the Southwest shakes out like this. Southeast, Great Lakes, West Central, and the Mid-Atlantic. What pops out to you there? It's going to get hot in here, isn't it? Am I the only one? Okay, if I'm the only one, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, what, what shakes out or jumps out to you here? Anything? What? We're the highest. We're the highest with marijuana and meth. Crack the lowest. Well, think about this. Um, crack is kind of relegated to uses, and remember that with drug distribution, it's just like the stock market. Supply and demand controls pricing. So as long as demand exceeds supply, prices will be high. Once supply exceeds demand, prices will drop. So in smaller communities like Missoula, you could take out a network, say, of crack users, and if there's not other people that are using crack, for example, the demand would go way down real quick if you were to take out some key players. Yep. How long can you actually keep up that customer base at 10 months every 10 days or whatever? Isn't that, can your buying really handle that? It depends. It just, yeah, if I'm making money from you, I buy money from the person above me, right? But won't I eventually not be a customer because I can't keep up with that? It depends. It just keeps changing because let's say you guys in these three rows are my customers and in one week he gets busted and I don't see him again, but you are still going and you have a friend that you come and introduce me to and I start selling to him or her, they're constant customers, they're coming to me, you're walking next to me, you're back. <laughs> uh, uh, um, yeah, I think the question is, though, how long can you stay on that without... How long can you stay on that? Well, I mean, how long can you keep the same customer base without having to recycle the new people? You just constantly move buying new people. And you think in the drug game, the bigger you get, the more stressful it's got to be. Because the bigger I get, the more people know me, the more people can stitch on me, right? So that's why we get so big that you're my connect to Missoula, and I don't know him or him or him or her, and you do, and you better not tell them anything about me. So when I sell you ounce amounts, and you gram it up and you sell to them, and so they never know me. That's why we in law enforcement are always trying to get the next fish, which is bigger than the one you got. We don't really want users, we want distributors. Does that answer your question? You're just saying, I guess it doesn't, I mean, you could be a customized for years. I could get busted, and then you're going to have to find another supplier. You could get busted. I guess it just oh, surprises me that somebody can do that kind of thing. How long can you live for that long? 10 hours oh. a day? Well, that's why people die of drug overdoses, so cardiac arrest and different things. <laughs> 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 I think you would be surprised, though, how long you go with, the, with addiction of yeah. 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 I saw a study that once said America represents 7% of the world's population, yet we consume just under 50% of the illegal drugs on Earth each year. 7% consumption of almost half. A lot of the money from the Southeast with poppy and heroin and South America and Central America just feeds America's habit constantly. I mean, it's just nonstop. I mean, it is unbelievable. Every single highway and freeway in America is a drug pipeline for somebody. Every single one. It's just pervasive. Unless you're not in the game, you don't know. But you can see that over 40 to 70 percent of all the drug distribution in America has a gang influence. And like I said, you're not going to have gangs without drug dealing, and you're not going to have gangs and drugs without violence. That's a sure thing. National Youth Gang Survey came out. And it came out in 1995 by the United States Department of Justice. And it was in that <laughs> late 80s, early 90s period that as gangs spread to smaller communities across the country, more and more non-gang victims started piling up. They're not the best shot. So once grandma in her house gets hit with a stray bullet on a drive-by shooting on a misidentified house, or a baby gets killed in a crib or somebody gets hit at a park from a bullet that was fired a quarter mile away, pretty soon there starts to be a public outcry. And if you think about it, did gangsters kill each other in the 70s and 80s? Yeah. 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 And you know why? It didn't affect you? Because you don't live in the hood. Bottom line, it didn't matter to us. It didn't matter to middle America 
until they started killing people in our backyards. And if you think about it, when they're killing each other in the hoods and the projects, Cabrini Greens, Nickerson Gardens, Jordan Downs, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect you at all. And it's not newsworthy. But once non-gang victims start to pile up, it is newsworthy. People start to know. We talk about perception. You start to learn. There's a public outcry. We need to do something about this. And OJJDP tries to commission a study to see what influence gangs have on our country because it seems like it's getting out of control. Crack is really starting to be a problem in a lot of cities. Youth crime rates and homicide rates are skyrocketing, and youth violence is being seen on a level that's never been seen before. So, they want to compile more consistent data to see what influence gangs have on America, and these surveys are sent to local law enforcement. The 2004 National Youth Gang Survey came out about five years after uh, well, I should say, just kind of about the midpoint from when it started to now, and these were the numbers. 2,296 agencies were sent the, the forms, 2,500 responded to it, a 90% response rate, pretty good, and that showed that 29% of all responding city and county law enforcement agencies reported gang problems. Not just a gang presence, but gang problems. Thanks. Is anybody else hot in here? Some of you look like you're hot. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I know you're interested, though, because you're following me around the room. Okay, so. Eighty-two percent of all cities the size of Missoula and larger, four out of five, reported gang problems. So. Urban areas in America are 50,000 population or greater. 82% almost eight years ago reported gang problems. 42% of suburban counties and then 14% of rural counties reported gang problems. So smaller cities as small as, say, Polson to Kalispell size are reporting gang problems. 27% responded to the survey. So the thing here is, in the 90s, it really became evident by the late 90s early 2000s, gangs were not a big city problem anymore. They were starting to be everybody's problem. And if there was a connect in your community, you could not have any control over stopping these guys coming into your community. Their connect could be a couple reasons we're going to talk about in a little bit. Street affiliates by age, under 15. This is from the 2004 survey, 11%. 15 to 17, you can see 29. 46% in young males, this half of them, this is the common age group of criminals. So if you look across the board, even if they're non-gangsters, offenders in America committing the seven index crimes are usually between the age of 18 and 26 is what it is. But gangsters, right, they're about half. Now, interesting thing here. In East L.A., it's a pretty cool place. Not a place you want to take your family to get to, uh, to Disneyland. But uh, down there in East L.A., White Fence, Tortilla Flats, 38th Street, some of the oldest gangs in Los Angeles from all the way back in the 1920s, 1930s, are in East L.A. Very steep in tradition. Boyle Heights is in that area. Another major gang, Hazard, is in that area. They see themselves as the protectors of the neighborhood. And you go down there... And you see a gangster, and you see his father, and you see his grandfather, and they're all gangsters. And it's amazing, because up here, you really only see youth gangs. You really see the kids. And the non-resident ones, which are dealing dope, those are in their 20s usually. But to see a 50-year-old Vato grandfather who's been gangbanging since the 60s or the 50s, and he's passed it to his son, who's passed it to his son, and now you start to think, how can we break this cycle? How is a social worker, or a school counselor, or a school resource officer, or someone who's trying to be a positive adult role model, break this cycle with this young juvenile. It's next to impossible. Because who do juvenile males look up to when they're little? Their father. And in the absence of their father, do they automatically look up to their mother? Not usually. They look up to an older male who's also in the family. So, if you sit this 12-year-old down, he's a 7th grader, 6th grader, and your school resource officer, you bring him in, and you say, hey, I want to talk to you a minute. I'm real concerned about some of the behavior that I'm seeing because you're a good little guy and I wanted to talk to you. It really looks that uh, you're kind of getting involved in this gang stuff. And I want to tell you, that's a big mistake. You know, it's, 
it's not good. It's not good to be in a gang. Um, it could get you in a lot of trouble, and I want to help you. Now, when did he stop listening to you? He stopped listening to you when you said it's not a good thing, because who did you disrespect? If his family, if his father, who he respects and looks up to, just like you guys look up to your father for a variety of reasons, if someone told you, hey, you're stupid because you do this, and it's taught to you by your father, you take a little offense to it, right? So even though that school resource officer or that adult is being honest and trying, you're going to miss that kid because you can't really say the game's bad without telling him his family is bad. Make sense? So we don't care about East L.A., we live in Missoula, Montana, and we live in smaller communities where we have an influence. Now, it's so simply said, but it makes so sense, so much sense. We don't have hoods in Missoula. We have neighborhoods. And what's the difference between a hood and a neighborhood? The sense, the sense of neighborhoods, right? You guys all live someplace, and you probably have older people in your neighborhood, and if you see him or her having trouble shoveling their walk, you help them. You see somebody having trouble getting their groceries, you help them. You might tell your neighbor when you see their son or daughter doing something mischievous in the neighborhood, or you might tell them to stop themselves because you have a sense of community and you care about your neighborhood and you care about your neighbors. In the cities, they do not. It's like a role reversal because the average person gets off work, they come home, they lock their doors, they got bars in the doors, bars in the windows, and if the police are outside, they don't get involved. You hear gunshots, you hear screaming, you don't get involved. You didn't see nothing. Because if your name gets put on that report and you get called into court, the gangs control everything. Okay? The gangs control where your brother is serving a probation violation in prison or the county jail. They control the school where your kids go. And if your name's there, they're going to get you. Now, you think about it, you think, Jesus, why do people live like that? They can't move. You, know, you live in Boyle Heights. And that's where your families lived for four generations. You can't move to Huntington Beach. <coughs> you got to live there. And there are people like you, because not everybody in these bad neighborhoods are bad people. There are average people like you that are relegated to live in that environment. And so they still need to teach their son how to shoot a layup, ride a bike without training wheels, take their daughter to the neighborhood grocery to get ice cream, send your kids down to get a gallon of milk. And in this time, gangs are everywhere. And now these kids, from a very small age, are exposed to what we couldn't believe up here. They're exposed to walking to school, having to walk around the blood that's there on the, on the sidewalk. They've been told by their parents, get out of bed, get under the bed, go lay in the, in the bathtub because shots are being fired outside. They know people that are getting shot. They know people that are pulling the trigger. And it's just part of this little person who's growing up as a sponge and that's all they know. Now, we're up here in the nice places in the world, in America, and we worry if our kids are too violent for much of video games, right? So when you think about when you take this kid and you transplant that kid from that environment, that gang environment like that, and you transplant him someplace like this, and he's of interest to other kids, you can see he's truly a big fish in a little pond. And I'll tell you an example right here in Missoula, a while back, had a kid out of California, if you're a juvenile and you do a homicide, you're convicted, you're probably going to serve about four to six years. So you shoot and kill somebody in a gangland shooting at 14, you're going to be out of jail by 18 and a half. And so do you think they use juveniles a lot to pull the trigger? Mm -hmm. All the time. Now, when you kill a person, do you think after you've killed one or after you've shot a gun or you've shot at people, you've done drive-by shootings, the more you do it, the harder or easier it gets? Easier. <coughs> easier. So... This kid was involved in a shooting, a killing in Sacramento, <coughs> and he was paroled to Missoula at 18 years old. He worked at Burger King on North Reserve. He went to Big Sky because he came here to live with a relative. Now that kid had killed someone before, and he had been in the game for three years prior to that, and now he's sitting next to your kid in English class at Big Sky High School, and you have two seniors, and one's from Missoula, and one's not, yet they're both American males, they are drastically different. That kid is going to use violence more quickly than your kid from up here. He's going to use it when someone, or more likely to use it if someone disrespects him, challenges him, questions him. Um, as you can see, because 
I remember being at a shooting down there once, and here's a the guy trying to go to in and out burger, and he didn't bargain to kill there is laying there in a parking lot. It's a hot day. There's a crowd of 300 people around. And moms are fanning their babies, and little kids are on their big wheels and their trikes, and I'm thinking, Jesus, I mean, if I <laughs> if I had somebody dead in my neighborhood and the blood run into the gutter, I would not let my five-year-old be out here seeing what's going on. I mean, I was concerned if I should let my little guy see their grandfather when he passed away from cancer or if that would upset him. Now, these kids are exposed to this at a very young age, and pretty soon, if you think about it, to kill another human being is way up there for us. And some of you, even though you say you could kill someone in protection of yourself or your family, if it came right down to it, you probably wouldn't be able to. So here it is to take another human life, and after you're growing up, and you hear the gunshots, and you know the shooters, and you know people get shot, and you're exposed to this violence at a very young age, pretty soon that bar starts to come down. And that bar is coming down, and now it is acceptable to use this level of violence when someone disrespects you, when someone mad dogs you, when somebody comes in your hood and they shouldn't, and all of a sudden you can see that acceptable level of violence is right there and it's used. Okay? Non resident gang affiliates usually pose a bigger problem for us because they're usually more organized and they're involved in drug distribution and they're more quick to shoot. And I can't tell you of an ongoing case, but I know one guy, a gangster out of California, who is in Missoula right now, he's already been to prison twice, and he is back again, and I know of three shootings he's done in Missoula. And he shot one guy over in 2300 Black at McDonald's, and uh, I mean, he's pulled the trigger three times in Missoula, and he also went to prison in California for shooting someone in AK-47. So he is here right now in your community, and that's just one. Okay, we'll talk more about numbers, but that guy is right here right now and getting in a traffic altercation with him or looking at him wrong or disrespecting him some way could get you into some problems that you wouldn't anticipate here in Missoula. Well, uh, yes. So why is he back out on the street after the first two? Uh, dealt crack cocaine in Billings, Montana, went to federal prison for five years, got out, met a girl from Missoula, was here, uh, shot a kid over on McDonald. Didn't get a great sentence from the state. I got him on having a gun, being a convicted felon, went back to federal prison for six years, got out, and now he's back here again because he's got the girl connect. So, social classification. A lot of people think that gangsters are poor. About 50% are, but 47% are just like you and I. Now, what's interesting here, this was taken in 2004. If we took this number, 20 years earlier, in 1984, do you think any of those numbers would be drastically different? Which ones would be different? Under class would be what? Uh, way higher, because in 1984, where were the majority of gangsters in America? They were still in the hoods. When they started to come to middle America, what is the majority of middle America? So now you can see these statistics are now starting to be influenced by the fact that they are spreading to other areas, and they're not just in the cities, but now you can see a cross-section of statistics now because they are influencing our children. You have rap music that glorifies gangs, you have professional athletes that glorify gangs, and that brings up a whole other issue. Think about this. Do you think every kid that you ask here or wherever, I want you to write down who your role model is. Do you think most kids write their parents down? What's that say about America? What's that say about our families? They write down who? Basketball player. They write down athletes. They write down who else? Entertainers. Entertainers and who else? Bad guys and rappers. And what does that tell you when here's a child who has not been taught that a role model is someone that is tangible, someone that can influence your life now and tomorrow, and someone you go to for help because their role model, what is their connection to this person? I should say, why are they looking to this person? What does this person have that mom and dad does not like? Money. Money. Fame. Yeah, money and fame. So think about that. I have three little boys. I get complimented a lot on how polite they are. That makes me feel good because having good manners is very important. But I literally, I bet five out of seven days a week have to remind them to hold the door for somebody, to say thank you, 
And I always joke with him. In fact, I just said it like two days ago. I said, now, you, know, you guys are always saying please and thank you when I'm not around, right? And he do that. So the thing is, I am having to drive this point into them daily to get them to be good little boys, to be polite and have manners. If I didn't do that, would they learn that? So now we start to look at the social fabric of America, and I can't get my soapbox here about what has changed from the early 70s to now, but you think about, we are not passing things on to our children, and now we're two generations deep that they are not passing on to their children, and that is really what you see in the violence of the 80s has now resulted in what we are seeing today in 2010 and 11, and these are not being passed down. Our morals and values are not being passed down, and manners, and history, and family importance, and taking care of your elders. Wow. Well, that's a lot of things we can't solve, right? But what we can solve is what we have influence on, your family, and being that, a positive, that positive adult role model to a kid when you can. So, raise your hand if you think Hispanics represent the highest number of gangsters in America. Okay? Raise your hand if you think African American. Caucasian. Asian, other, what would other be? <laughs> Russian. <laughs> Russian. I hear that every time and I say the same thing, they're white like us. But anyway, um, others would be Native American. So, Hispanics, almost one out of two gangsters in America in 2004 were Hispanic. Only makes sense, 1990-2000 census, which was the greatest immigrant numbers to America, Hispanic. Okay, and they represent the gang numbers now. Probably if you look for, sociologically, the distribution of wealth, you can see where they're at in many of the places where they're at. African American, one out of three. Caucasian, 13%. Asian, always about seven. And other, Native American. Now, Hispanics and African Americans, Hispanics have been involved in gangs on the West Coast 60, 70 years. African Americans since the 50s, 60s, really. Caucasians, not really since the 90s. Asians, 80s, 90s. And then African American, or excuse me, Native Americans. Historically, Native Americans have not involved themselves in the gang mentality or culture. Yet this generation has fully immersed. And it doesn't matter if you're in an Indian reservation in the Southwest, or you're influenced by Phoenix or Tucson or a large urban area, or you're in the middle of nowhere in eastern Montana in Poplar or Wolf Point. There's big time problems on Indian reservations. So if we took this number 20 years earlier, 1984, would any of these be different? Non-existent, 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 much higher, would you agree? Yeah. Because what's happening in, what is the majority of middle America? What race? White. So I mean, as they come and they start to influence resident youth, they start to see these numbers. And if you were to look at our resident youth in Missoula, we live in a community of 93, 94% Caucasian. Our resident youth gang affiliates are going to represent that too. Do these numbers include motorcycle clubs? No, these are all just youth gangs. Okay, so this is important to know that all races of youth have become involved in gangs. So when people say, well, he can't be a gangster because I know all of them are this race or that race, it's not that way anymore. Okay, so all races of youth have involved themselves in gangs. Now, in 2008, we get a little more current here. National Youth Gang Survey comes out. How many different youth gangs do you think were determined to be active in America? Not just the Crips and the Bloods that we hear about, but Folk and People Nation, Black Ancient Disciples, Vice Lords, Latin Kings, Nuestra Familia, La MA. How many different gang sets do you think were active in the United States in 2008? Hundreds. 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 How many do you think? 1,500. 1,500. 3,000. What do you think? 1,000. 1,000. How about you? Twenty-eight thousand different gang sets identified in the United States. Seven hundred and seventy-four thousand gang affiliates active in thirty-three hundred law enforcement jurisdictions. That's in two thousand eight. National Youth Gang Center estimates one third of every city and county law enforcement jurisdiction in America has gang problems in two thousand eight. Not just a gang presence, but gang problems. Gangs remain to be a major problem and widespread problem in our country. So what's the criteria for being a gang? We'll talk about that. Okay. 2009 National 
gang threat assessment comes out by a different part of the federal government, and they find, this is in January 2010, this is published from 3,052 agencies, they find that 20,000 street gangs are active in the United States, 900,000 affiliates with 147,000 more incarcerated in our correctional facilities, state, county, and federal. Does affiliate just mean an individual? Yeah, one gang member. Street gangs currently active in all 50 states, and they continue to migrate from urban areas to suburban areas and rural America. I would say these numbers, you saw one at 27,000 sets, you saw this one over 20,000 sets, are wrong. And I would say they're low. Does anyone disagree or agree? Do you think every law enforcement agency that responds to these surveys has an accurate understanding of what's going on in their jurisdiction? No. Do you think every chief and sheriff wants to admit they have gang issues? No. Is that positive on them? No. And do you think every community, chamber of commerce, mayors, county commissioners, people that are government entities, not law enforcement, do you think they want to disclose that information? Some of those trifold brochures that you put out to attract businesses to your community, do you put it's a beautiful place. We have a river and all this. On the back page it says, and by the way, we have drugs, youth violence, and a healthy gang problem. <laughs> they don't put that on there, right? Because that's not a positive thing. Because of that, I would say these numbers are low. But how many in here are astounded by these numbers? And we talked about perception. And all of you are leaders in our community, and you're smarter than the average person, and you know what you know, but you don't know what you don't know. Right? So gang says, yes? Yeah? I'm sorry, if you got if you've got 20,000 gangs and 900,000 gang members, the math is 45 members per gang. That seems that seems like a that seems like a football team. That doesn't seem I mean, that doesn't seem big enough to be yeah, a gang. In my some opinion. gangs are as little as three or four or five members, and some are as big as 1,500 members. So, I mean, they vary, and those are the only ones identified by law enforcement. Right? You can't speculate on what you don't know. So if you say in your community have this set and you've identified eight members, you can't say there's 10 or 20, you've got to say there's eight. Right? So those numbers are low, but is it a magical number? They say that less than 1% of people in America are gangsters, but there's 310 million Americans. I mean, that's a huge number. And you think about trying to control correctional facilities with a gang influence is next to impossible. And they're influencing every single person that comes in there because that's a micro-society in prison. So you can see here the Northwest, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, 36,000 gang affiliates uh, in those four states. What do you think are some indicators of a street gang presence? Graffiti. 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 What else? Color. Color. activity. Color. Hospitalized yep. individuals. What did you say? <laughs> I said hospitalized. Hospitalized, yeah, there you go, people with added holes. <laughs> Mannerisms, graffiti, admission, predatory mentality, is that common? Are kids more predatory now? Are kids more violent today? Do kids solve problems, beating people's ass and vandalizing their cars for going out with their girl? And I mean, kids are more violent today than they just are. Not just gangsters. How about confrontational? Is this just restricted to gangsters, or do you think kids are more this way towards teachers? I think that's all people right now. All people, there you go. <laughs> Retaliation and payback, crimes and activity. Why do kids join gangs? Why do you think kids join gangs? Belonging. Sense of belonging or a lack of Perfection. perception of that. What else? Protection. Protection. Real or perceived, that's a good one. What else? Power. Power, you said money? money. Power, what else? Family, that's a good one. Does your family have a big influence in how you behave? Yeah. I can show you a video of about a four-year-old dancing and his big brother is giving him a gun and the kid's so little that he can't even hold the gun up and they're just whooping and hollering and he's dancing to hip-hop music dressed in a bandana. He can't be any older than probably five and they're laughing and letting him drink malt liquor and I mean, you think about that kid and he just emulates his big brothers, right? And he thinks they're cool. So. Lack of acceptance within their families is a huge one. This one's big. Is this something any one of us can do? Is this something you can do? Yes. You can. Because, you know, a youth violence, drug, and gang problem is not my problem. Whose problem is it? Our own. And communities that approach it as a community problem are more successful than agencies or law enforcement agencies that try to correct it through enforcement. Because there's only limited benefit here. 
And really, comparing yourself to other cities has limited benefit also, because I could really care less about East LA and Sacramento and Spokane or even Great Falls or Billings because this is where I live, this is where my kids go to school, this is where I have a realm of influence. And the thing is, we can all be that positive adult role model when you see these kids that are at risk, okay? And they might be some of your kids' friends, they might be the neighbor kid, but it takes energy. And we're all so what? Busy. We're all so busy. Sometimes we're too busy to really pay enough attention to our own kids. But we can always do that a lot, that positive adult role model. Influenced by friends and family, like we talked about. Protection, you said that. Status and reputation. What you don't have in the individual, you will have through the gang, right? On reputation, money, and opportunity. Glorification of gangs. If you knew what to look for, you would see professional athletes and college athletes throwing hand signs on ESPN. I've seen it probably half a dozen times. And they try to blur it out if it's obvious, but they don't always know either. Um, and you will see, and they're not always doing number one, when they're doing ham signs, and you can see it, there's lots of gangsters in the NFL and in the NBA. And you would think, Jesus, why would they still do that? They got out of the hood and made themselves better. Why do they do that? Because they're proud of it. They're as proud, some of these guys, as their gang involvement as a U.S. Marine is. And that's who they are. That's who they were when they were little, and they don't leave it. They go in the NFL. They go back to the hood in the offseason. What's with all the greasy fingers? Is it all the signs? No. Are they, is it sign language? The police. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Is it all sign They all have uh, um, hand signs to show different things. You know, I mean, usually, you know, east side, grip. I mean, BK, they, they, they all have that stuff. So that just shows that represents, they use that for challenges. If I'm throwing a hand sign to you and your arrival and basically challenging you, telling you who I am, what's up, kind of thing. So communication. Looking at that and thinking about what you're saying, it sounds a lot like a fraternity mentality. Well, I was in a fraternity in Norway. Well, I'm just kidding. No. But really, Yep, you're right. That's, uh, and you can see that. Because you know what? Do we act differently in groups? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do the police have to face that? I deal with two drunks downtown and want to give me a problem. Are they as big a threat to me that if all of you are outside of a bar and now these guys throw a bottle at me, is somebody else more likely to get involved because they have the anonymity of the crowd, right? So, yes. And you're right, this thing perpetuates because as we get you into our group, or the fraternities you say, we're going to educate you and get you to get new members. As far as communities being most effective when they embrace it as a community, the anti you know, gang approach. If you were to rate from zero to ten, zero being communities that are in complete denial and aren't doing anything about it, don't want to even think about it, and ten being a commu a communities that are really embracing it as community, proactively going together after the problem, where would you put Missoula? Seven. And we'll talk about Missoula here in just a little bit as we sum this up, but I'll tell you why that is. Gangs migrate for a variety of reasons. They move through family arrangements. 17,000 people moved to Missoula County between 90 and 2000, and it's pretty close to about 12,000 more people have moved to Missoula County between 2000 and 2010. So that's 30,000 people. Do you think any of them came from cities? Do you think any of them came here to get their kids out of that environment? And now they bring their kid here, their kid appreciate that opportunity and leave it behind? No, now they're a big fish in a little pond and kids are interested in them. So, organized criminal effort, relocated through interstate compacts. That's where they relocate offenders, and they do that with juveniles, just like the one I told you. He was relocated here, and he was only here for a short time before he was violated, went back to California. But you don't know about them, and we can't tell you about them. And they're in schools with your kids, and the schools can't know about them because it's confidential criminal justice information. But they're here, so that happens. Military duty assignments. It is amazing. You think that we have probably put, well, not probably, we have put hundreds of thousands of soldiers through the Afghanistan and Iraq theaters in the last decade, and lots of them are gang members. Now, some use the military to get out of it, and they better themselves. That's great, but they all don't do that. Some go in, they get the training, the tactics, they come back to the hood, and who do they use that against? Us, you, and their rivals. So you're starting to see that, too, more ambushes and more assaults. Uh, that are you seeing it relevant or related to military. Think there's any been any gangsters on any grizzly football teams? 
And if you think about this, a lot of people think that gangsters are losers, but that's not the case. I mean, if you're a kid growing up in the hood and your parents cannot move you from there, but you're a gifted athlete, you got to survive. So you get picked on in middle school at fifth and sixth grade. It's either join a gang and stop getting picked on, form a new gang because it's a rival to protect yourself, and then they just do their athletics like they do. They get picked up by a college, and again, just like the military, some appreciate that. They leave that mentality behind, and they get out of the hood. But do they all do that? No. And now all of a sudden, you have a kid in wherever. Uh, it brings to mind, uh, probably about three, four years ago, there were three Westside Rolling 60 Crips out of Long Beach, all on scholarship at Washington State. Now, prior to that, did that set have any connection to Pullman, Washington? And now my homeboy's up there, let's go see, let's go see, let's check it out. Wow, girls are friendly to us up here. <laughs> People are friendly. The cops waved to us. Holy shit, I can take a gram up there? I can take an eight ball and sell it for three? No one's shooting at me. The police aren't kicking my ass. Why well, go back to Long Beach, right? So now I have a connection, usually with a girl. Get her pregnant, have a reason to stay there, do some petty crime, get on probation. Now I'm on probation in that community, and that cycle just continues. So, you know, if the most recent one, you know, those grizzly athletes that were uh, doing the home invasion robberies a few years ago, uh, four or five of them were gang members from the community they came from. So Pasadena, Los Angeles, and uh, Las Vegas. So, you know, they come up here and they think we're hicks, and they can just pull the game on them up here, and they do. So. Reasons that they migrate. Hey, guy. Yes. What? There's also gang members on the um, Bobcat. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> 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 he's fairly confident, so he's really Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, lots of gang members in college athletics. Like I said, some uh, use it to get out. In fact, any Colorado fan of anyone, weren't you? Okay. <laughs> Look at that, I trained the guy, and now he's a captain. Anyway, but, uh, 1991, in six weeks, August, early September, three shootings in Missoula that were gang-related. The first shooting that was gang-related in Missoula was in the 1300 block of Dickinson in the Rattlesnake. And you had a couple big side kids, a 15-year-old, they are calling themselves ground control boys, or three white knights, I can't remember, they were local gangsters, and they got kicked out of this party, no criminal record, they got assaulted kind of by some Helga kids, get in their car, and as they drive by, he stands out of the sunroof and shoots all six rounds out of a revolver and hits two kids. Neither of them were fatal. There's a fight in Karis Park in which two gangsters out of Bellevue or Bellingham, Washington shoot a kid in Karis Park, and then there's another kid shot in Greeno Park over a disturbance that that one never had any suspects identified and he was shot in the torso with a shotgun. So none of those were fatal, but those were the infant stages of our gang activity in Missoula. And over the next two, three years, this gang mentality was really starting to be pers more consistent with the local youth. And then a kid moved here from Denver. I remember that kid, his name was Smith, and he was 19. And when he came up here, all of a sudden, you started seeing all these kids wearing red and claiming to be bloods. And they were claiming to be bloods from Colorado, even though they weren't from there, but he was their influence, and he had the influence of them. He didn't last very long. He was gone. And then a kid moved here from California, and another kid from Washington, excuse me, and they started a crip set, because they were both crips where they came from, and they beat in about a dozen kids at one of the high schools, and we started to see more of a non-resident influence. In 1994, we had a shooting in the 800 block of West Pine, in which a uh, gangster out of Reno, Nevada, shot another gangster from uh, Patterson, California, and Norteño shot him in the face of the party when he disrespected him, and that was our first shooting that involved non-resident gang affiliates. So in 95, 96, our activity is hopping, and we start the Target Enforcement Unit. The Target Enforcement Unit was started really to deal with the gang influence that we started to see in Missoula because in 94, two of us went to Spokane because Spokane was about five years deep into their gang issues. And we started to see that we need to jump on this because you don't want to wait until the window of opportunity slams shut. And I can show you an example of Spokane. We don't have time. Spokane is just off the hook, did not have 
community support, and if you know what to look for, every time you go to Spokane, I don't care if you're in Northtown or that uh, Spokane Valley Mall downtown, who fast, there's gangsters everywhere in Spokane. And again, we talk about perception. You and I can look at the same person and we see two different people. I can see the concealed gun they got in their waistband and you didn't even look for it. I can see the swagger and listen to their verbiage and you didn't even notice it. So again, we talk about perception and it is perception reality. So, Spokane, we try to learn from them, we try to adapt what works here in Missoula, and we take a zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. It doesn't matter if it's a local middle school kid or a non-resident gang affiliate, we're going to deal with them as zero tolerance. We get the county attorney on board who really talk to the district court judges, and we start to see several more shootings in the mid-90s, and we flush about a dozen problem children out of Missoula, about 15 of them actually, and it really kind of bit the head off the snake. The target enforcement unit was key. Um, several of us did that, and the cool thing about that was we didn't answer the radio, we were in plain clothes, and all we did is go out 40 hours a week and look for gang members and do targeted assignments. So. Uh, hotel uh, clerks had our pagers. They would call us when people would come in, check, pay with cash. They're from Washington, Oregon, California, Utah. And we just targeted their activity. We were very proactive, and that has really been the key to our success because communities that are reactive are not as successful. And law enforcement usually is reactive. In most facets, somebody is victimized, somebody calls 911, the police are dispatched, you're already reacting. When you can be proactive, you're it's more advantageous, especially when it comes to guns and violence. And that's why, for example, this FBI task force I'm on now, we're going to focus on the very violent criminals in our community, and we're going to put our resources into getting them with guns and drugs. And you're going to hear things come out in the news here very shortly I can't talk about, but major distribution uh, <coughs> that we interrupted. Okay. And, uh, you know, for example, one, one problem child, is he's going to get, well, two of them. One got 200 months two weeks ago, and another one got 180 months federal time. So I will never see them again. I've been dealing with them for 15 years. So if you take off, and maybe in this year, in 2011, we only get six or eight, but that's six or eight major problem people in Missoula who are trigger pullers and who are distributors and who are violent mentality. And if we focus them with the federal system, we get rid of them, it's going to make our community better. Now. Comparing our community to other communities, as I said before, is limited value because it's really what we do today is what our community will be tomorrow. What we did five years ago is why we're where we're at now, and what we do today is going to be influenced as to where Missoula is five years from now. I never have liked the term wannabe. How many people use that? <laughs> the term wannabe, if you think about it, is the only aspect of criminality in which we negate the threat that a person can pose to us or our community. We have people raping people here, but we don't call them wannabe rapists. We have people robbing people here, and we don't call them wannabe robbers. They are what they are. They're rapers, they're rapists and robbers. Yet if you get a local kid, you have a tendency to call them a wannabe. Because really the only bad kids that really can affect our neighborhood are those ones from California and the cities. And that's not true because I didn't like that term before. And I definitely didn't like the term after Heinle was shot by a wannabe because Heinle's dead now because of that guy's actions. And so, Missoula is a small enough community that we may not have 400 gang related homicides each year, but small incidents like David Wurst, an eighth grader at CS Porter who killed Glenn Klein in a TNC Lounge parking lot over a carton of cigarettes in 1996, 1990. Eight. I mean, those little incidents can really shock a community our size, and we don't want to sit there and wait until we're reacting and the window of opportunity has closed itself. We traveled all over the country trying to see what will work. We now have a street crimes unit with a sergeant and two officers, and I'm the investigator that does the investigations for gang related stuff. We're now in a task force, which is part of the Central Montana Gang Task Force, which is FBI agents and local police from Missoula and Great Falls, and then educating our community, and that's what we're doing. As I said, I've probably done 220 some presentations all over the Northwest, as far away as Las Vegas, but lots of them here in Missoula and Montana, because this is where our realm of influence is. And like I said, it's not my problem, it's your problem, and we need to work together to be successful. This zero tolerance approach is the right and only way to do it, 
And has it worked? It most definitely has worked because we do not have a gang problem in Missoula today. We never have. Do we have a gang presence? Yes, we do. We have non-resident gang uh, influence or presence and a resident gang presence. We have no active gangs now. And we've had probably 15, 16, 17 gangs over the last 15 years, and they've all been squashed by us. So does that mean that we can rest our hat on the past? No because we could be inundated with gangsters this spring and be behind the eight ball this summer. But we have been diligent enough and we've worked and been proactive enough that today Missoula does not have gangs. Billings does, Great Falls does, and Great Falls is 15,000 smaller than Missoula, and I know for a fact the word is out in those Spokane or those Washington source cities, Yakima, Tri-City, Spokane, and these gangsters come through Missoula and they go on to Great Falls. And now, when we enforce the law and our will on these guys in our proactive efforts to enforce the law and impress our will to make them go elsewhere, I, I don't need to apologize where they go. I just care that they're not here. They're not where my kids go to school. They're not where I'm going to live. And they're not where my grandpa and grandma go for a drive and go to Dairy Queen. So the thing is, we have to have a realm of influence on what we can change. We have to work together. It's a community effort, and when we approach it as that and continue to do that, we're going to be successful. The police can't do it on our own. Real quick, I have five minutes, right? Quarter till? Six minutes? Seven? Yeah, five. Our height task force, real quick, to get, out, to get our height task force, we had to prove that there was an interstate gang nexus in Missoula, or we would never have got a height task force. So the fact we have one proves that we had an uh, interstate drug trafficking network. <coughs> These numbers are from 06, $13 million seized by Haida. You can see those numbers, 66 pounds of cocaine, 5 pounds of meth, 1,300 pounds of marijuana. That's five years old now. Um, but what I wanted to show you is this connection to Spokane is not even big like a California connection. You buy an ounce of meth or coke right now. I mean, we go to Spokane for about $900 an ounce, buy an ounce of cocaine or meth. We bring back to Missoula and we sell it for $100 a gram, and we even sell it for $120 a gram on the reservation north of here. Polson will pay $20 more than it is in Missoula. So we take this ounce, we gram it up, 28 grams, $120 a gram. We have a $2,500 profit on one ounce. Now you buy 10 ounces, that's $25,000, and that's what we could drive to Spokane right now and be right back in Missoula with ounce amounts of cocaine and meth by midnight tonight. So, how does this affect you? Economic impact of meth in Missoula. One gram of methamphetamine to feed one user. Eighth gram dosage every four to six hours. One gram lasts two to three days. They're using about two grams per week. Eight to ten grams per month, which equals 100 grams per year, which is three to four ounces on a user of average quantities. 100 grams is usually worth about 12,000. Now, a lot of times these people are not working, and they're stealing, and they're robbing, and they're taking your checkbook out of your purse at Walmart, and they're forging checks, they're robbing convenience stores and casinos, and so what is the economic impact of one drug user in our community? It is pretty big. 12,000 in drug consumption by one person. Okay. Hopefully, I impressed you. I don't know if you're hot. I'm hot, but uh, <laughs> it's hot in here. So I'm going to finish with this video. Uh, if any of you are interested in me coming and helping you or doing any additional presentations, I'm going to leave some cards up here. There's my information. But I want to share this with you. Keep in mind this cycle of violence that I talked about and how as we as Americans use violence as a solution. Gangs play into this. I made this video about <coughs> four years ago. And I've been contacted by professors from Middle Tennessee State, Penn State, Cal State Irvine, all asking my permission. And I have no idea how they got this because I just made it on my computer. And then it went out there. But this one has really made the rounds. I've made probably 30, 35 videos. This one is one of my favorites. And I want to share this with you just to make you think. It's very moving. It's pretty intense. And if you don't want to see someone get shot, when you see the two people by the elevator, don't watch. So as community members, um, should we just keep on having community as our core, and that's how we keep this out. How can we help you? Yeah. You report things to us. 
because when you see people come into apartments and duplexes and houses next door and there's quick frequent trips and it seems that doesn't seem right, it's not right. They're selling dope. And you, I mean, there's a 80,000, 70,000 people in Missoula, there's only 100 of us. So we have 100 sets of eyes. You guys are here. We show us information. You reporting to us, reporting to the school resource officer where your kids go to school and not tolerating everything. For the graffiti, you report it. We get rid of it. You see drug activity. You see somebody bullying your kids, doing things they shouldn't. Report it. Get involved and work together. Call 911. Call 911. <laughs> okay. We'll finish on this. Enough I didn't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> is a key because we know what we know and we don't know what we don't know so uh, thank you that took a little bit out of me I don't know how I do these all the time I just know I can chat for hours on this stuff uh, hopefully it was entertaining for you and I appreciate your time thank you and there's some cards up here if I can help you with anything else dispensaries all over Missoula. Some other cities try to relegate that. There's lots of dispensaries within a thousand feet of a school now. So what do we do? Um, and you know, it's, it's kind of tenuous because states cannot, states can be more strict than federal law, but they can't be less strict. The federal government says marijuana is illegal, and states and communities say, it's not here, it's going to be legal. You can't do that. I mean, are they going to expend the energy to prosecute people here? That's going to go city by city, but you know, everybody and their brother has medical marijuana cards now, and it's really proliferated, in my opinion. It's going to make it more easy for my kids to get it because their friends' parents now have it. No one's hiding it. I, mean, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't really care if marijuana is legal or not. I wouldn't smoke it. Um, it doesn't matter to me. And like cocaine is more important than some of the other drugs. Methamphetamine really plays into violence. But you know, people high on marijuana kill people. You know, accident, traffic accidents, marijuana is in the system of fatality accidents about a third of the time we heard. So. Thank you. Yeah, real quick, what is, what is done in the school district? And what is sent, so obviously my kids go to Chicago. the gang stuff? Yeah, well, gang stuff and some of the violence and some of the drug stuff that you talked about, et cetera. The school resource officers, the city has school resource officers in the city schools. Hellgate, for example, is a county school in the city, so I don't know what they do there, but the school resource officers, that's what they do. They're not just there to write kids tickets, they're there to educate the kids and help them make decisions and do things. So I think, especially in the lower grade schools, they're helping excuse me, the kids make decision making stuff. The high school ones are kind of more enforcement, but that just kind of... Uh, but how's that kind of gets a parent? I mean, you know, as a parent sitting here watching this, Living in Missoula now, I can perform in a lot of different things there, but, you know, this, this is the first time I've seen you know, that kind of thing. You can, you can be pretty nice to it without that. Yeah, and that's the thing, is hopefully one thing we do is we educate you to be more aware of it, sure. because it does go on here, not to the level it has elsewhere, but again, you know, one gang-related homicide, one officer involved shooting to paralyze an officer for the rest of his life, that's one too many, you know. So if a kid's got a gun, he's willing to pull the trigger. It doesn't matter if he's from Lolo or L.A., he's a problem for our community. I didn't know if there was just a specific, like, program with some... There is no program. The great program is not implemented in Missoula, but great addresses gangs. But I'm sure there's a school resource option. If you're interested, contact your school's principal and ask them. I, I didn't really have a question, just a comment. Um, I don't even remember why we were talking about it, but when I picked up my son from the day last week, 
You mentioned something about the zero tolerance policy and nobody can wear bandanas. Yeah, that should be. You shouldn't let them wear colors of any kind. Yeah, they can't wear any Anybody need a card? Okay. Thank you, guys. Yep, thank you. So these are our DUI guys. <laughs> you probably don't want to meet these when you're driving down the road. This is Bob Frankie. Uh, he is a patrol officer with the Missoula Police Department for three and a half years. Um, he's a police vehicle operations course instructor and the senior breath testing specialist. And a drug friend expert. Yes. And then this is Matt Mitsinski. And originally from Tacoma, Washington, and moved to Missoula in 2004 to pursue his law enforcement career. He has a BA in uh, personal, criminal justice from the Washington State University. Um, he has been an officer with the Missoula Police Department for the last six years and has cur currently assigned to. I had to word in all these words. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, currently assigned to the traffic unit as a motorcycle officer. Um, he's a member of the SWAT team, a field training officer for new recruits, and recently became a drug recognition expert. And he has investigated over 100 plus DUIs in his career. Yeah.
crashes, almost 200. Um, injury crashes related to impaired driving, about 53. And that doesn't include the, the sheriff's department or the highway patrol. How does Montana compare with the rest of the nation? There's a whole bunch of numbers up there, but what I want to point out, the far right is um, the percentage. Nationally, 38%, Montana, 42%. Uh, what that means is uh, the total fatalities in Montana compared to the rest of the country, uh, it shows a BAC of 0.01, basically just saying that there's alcohol involved. So Montana is above the national average on that. Okay, so obviously we have a, a problem. <clears throat> Another national stat, basically, uh, and it shows you know, who was drunk uh, with a, a 0.08 plus VA uh, level. Um, so it's not only the drivers, but the passengers are very likely to be intoxicated above a point of weight. Um, and I just threw this in the children. Obviously, children are going to be affected. Um, okay, so Montana. What is the law in Montana? What does it state? Uh, the specifics. Um, some of the key items here that need to be pointed out is Driving under the influence of alcohol or any other substance that impairs you is against the law, okay? Uh, you have to be in actual physical control of a motor vehicle while on the road. Okay, and that can be on private property or on public roadway. That includes sitting at the wheel even if the car is turned off. Correct. So there's a little bit of interpretation there, but actual physical control. Um, for me, you're in the driver's seat, you have the keys in, in the ignition, the vehicle's off, you're in, you're in actual physical control of that motor vehicle. Um, so I would process you for DUI. So the vehicle doesn't have to be on. I don't know. Well, to answer that maybe a little bit, uh, there's an MHP officer that actually got somebody for DUI while they were sleeping outside of their vehicle in the ditch. But he could prove that the only way that that car got there was by that driver, and he had the keys in his pocket, and he's drunk. So, I mean, there's a little bit of investigation that has to go into that. But yes, you don't have to have the key on to so get the, the keys in your possession, then, or what's the connector, then, right? I just have to prove that you were in physical control of that. So, any way that I can to prove that you're in physical control of that motor vehicle and that you're impaired. At the time that you were drunk, right? So if you drove downtown and slept it off in the back, but didn't drive down the road, right? Would that be different? As long as you weren't driving, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to pick up on, on you at all. So You said motor vehicle, but the language of this is vehicle. What, what is that? A like golf cart? <laughs> 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 Good question. And we have a lot of scooters, and we have a lot of um, underpowered little things running around town. I'm sure they get great gas mileage. 50 cc or larger on the motor. And obviously, this includes like you know boats. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. But you can ride a bike drunk home. Yeah. Yes. 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 You can. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't recommend that, but. Uh, Remember when you're looking at these stats too, they got all these, you're looking at stats and, it, and there's a lot of numbers involved and you're trying to get a handle on it. One thing to remember, when you're looking at that and they're saying, well, 14% were reported, reported themselves as having driven drunk or driving impaired. What's impaired? What's under the influence to you? So how, that number's a little, could be a little bit off. Okay. The other thing, when you're looking at DUI stats, they've done a study that said for every DUI that I get, that person's driven drunk 70 times. Oh my God. Okay, so 
Yeah, just keep that in mind when you go through this. Yeah, and I will uh, just read some of the other stats too. It's, it's got to be hard, but they say one in three. So if we're processing a person, there's three others that are driving undetected, I guess. And I know it's a lot higher than that. Um, so basically, once again, that just talks about what actual physical control is, talks about can be driving uh, a motor vehicle while under alcohol or dangerous drugs or any other type of uh, narcotic. Now, we have DUI, which says that everybody knows 0.08 is a legal limit, right? So we stop you, we administer the tests, uh, we notice indicators, you give a breath sample, you're above 0.08, you're going to go to jail. Um, there's a per se law, which means in and of itself, if you're over the legal limit, it's a DUI. So you may think that you're driving just fine, you're driving home just fine, uh, you're not showing any indicators, you're not swerving, I mean, you're doing great, but you get stopped, you do a breath, uh, take a breath sample, and you're over, it's a DUI. So we don't necessarily have to show that you're impaired, we just have to show that you're above the legal limit. Does that make sense? But don't you have to have a reason to pull somebody over? <laughs> yes, but, but now, I mean, not all stops are going to be associated with what you think, associated with drunk driving, you know what I mean? Because people speed, people run stop signs, you know. So. It's a great question, you know, we can't just randomly pull people over. But the DUI law states specifically that it's not a probable cause issue where you have to commit a violation for me to pull you over. That's not it at all. It says it has to be reasonable suspicion that you're driving impaired. And reasonable suspicion would be maybe you're leaving the downtown area at 2 o'clock in the morning. The only thing that's open at 2 o'clock in the morning in downtown is bars. And I see you weave back and forth in your lane. You're not committing a violation. That's reasonable suspicion. Does that answer that? It's the totality of the circumstances when it comes down to the final charge. Don't you do DUI check stations that I mean, you kind of announce them before, like after Grizz games and things? Aren't there like task force stations? <laughs> You've seen the big bus. The uh, highway patrol's got the big bus. And uh, it's a... Testy Festy. Yeah, Testy Festy will be out at Clinton Fire Station. will be sitting out alongside the road. You'll see it around every now and then. And that's just a mobile testing station. It has everything that we process people with there. Um, we just recently started doing actual checkpoints. Safety checkpoints. They're not DUI checkpoints. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> so don't have insurance, insurance, not <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. And also, too, commercial driver's limit is different than normal. Uh, it's a .04. So, but. so if you pull somebody over that's showing severe impairment, would they roll .07? Still can get a DUI. Still can. Absolutely. So it doesn't have to be a .08. I mean, you can have a .06, .05. But I mean, if you're, you're driving impaired and I can prove that you're impaired, it's a DUI. Uh, Missoula, you guys heard, I think it was last year, they passed that city ordinance uh, which states, and it's a good thing, uh, you can't refuse a, a breath sample. If an officer believes that you're uh, driving impaired um, and he asks you for a breath or blood sample, it's a crime under our city ordinance to refuse it. Uh, obviously, you can refuse it, uh, but the consequences are... $500 fine, it's non jailable and it's on top of the state um, fine and push, punishment. So, yeah. you have a question? Yeah, um, I got into an argument with somebody the other day about <laughs> medical marijuana and driving under the influence because they were saying that they were less impaired being under the influence of marijuana than, they, than I would have been drinking or something along those lines. And yeah. I was trying to explain to them that under the influence is under the influence. What are we doing to educate people that yeah. do the medical marijuana that drive and think they're less impaired and not going to get caught and not going to do it? Yeah, you're right. And that's where Matt and I do a lot of our, or try to do a lot of our work is in the drug side. Uh, medical marijuana, absolutely. 
they're all, you know, chill. <laughs> Wait for the stop that. sign to turn right. green. Yeah, <laughs> and they all think it's fine. They all feel fine, and that's the problem with it. But just as bad as prescription drugs, and it's just as bad a problem for us. So, uh, yeah, there needs to be some education on there. Um, but the whole medical marijuana thing, we're just a whole. We could spend all day. <laughs> yeah, we could spend all day. <laughs> but it's a, it's. With our training, it's a little bit different. There's different testing that we do with it, so it's. But either way, if you're smoking and driving, absolutely do you want. We have to show impairment. It's a little bit different than alcohol, um, but yeah. How do you do it? Is it the eye, the eye test? Or how do you, is it yeah, the same we'll, testing? We'll get, we'll get into the, the standard DUI tests that we do, um, but there's quite a few more as far as your drugs. Because we have to pinpoint what type of drug it is. And in the end, what we want is a blood sample from them. And so at the end of our tests, we'll say we think it's you know this category of drugs. And then the blood sample will come back and either confirm it or deny it. Uh, and with our training, it's, it's, it's not too hard to, to, to be on. So. A, lot of, a lot of the drug stuff that we see is going to be combinations of alcohol with another depressant or alcohol with cannabis. Yeah, that's huge now. How do we have the training? This, the combo is, is, is there. On the drug test, is it blood draw or urine? Some states do urine. Uh, okay, alcohol in the human body. Obviously, we're talking about. Yeah. I've got one. I've got a question with a drug test and an alcohol test. You get fine if you do the breathalyzer that you know indicates how much you've been drinking. But is there like a drug? Do you can you administer like a, a blood test sort of right there like you would a breathalyzer? I mean, how do you? I mean, is there a fine for that? Are you using to do that or? Um, the, the refusal states that any if you refuse any test that I ask you to take, it's a refusal. Okay. Period. No matter what. Okay. Breath, blood, whatever. And that's what that new love that high point that Correct. Okay. That's Correct. the same as the state. Okay. They just made it, they just emphasized it more as a city ordinance. Correct. So, okay. So do people drive different under the influence of prescription drugs than alcohol? I mean, are there different things you watch for? It's just, a, it's just impairment in general. Um, I mean, but yeah, there can be. You know, um, if you have stimulants versus a depressant, you know what I mean? They're going to be more hyped up, so they may do something a little bit different when they're driving. Um, once again, I mean, each drug category has different indicators for us that we look for. So it, yeah, it could change their driving a little bit. They could be driving faster as opposed to you know, if they're stoned. <laughs> uh, so alcohol in the human body, obviously we're talking about ethanol. It's a central nervous system depressant, as we all know. Um, it directly impairs divided attention, which, is, which just simply means your ability to multitask or do more than one thing uh, at once. Um, so it would affect, you know, uh, as a, like the state said here, paying, paying attention to the road, using your blinker, uh, tuning the radio, doing all those things that we do on a daily basis. It depresses your system, and you're not able to, you know, basically do all those things at once. Um, right here at the bottom, at different levels uh, of alcohol consumption, it affects different parts of our brain and our functions, uh, our judgment. It'll start affecting that old point or point oh four. Our senses will start going uh, dull at point oh six. Gross and fine motor skills at point oh eight, and then Autonomic functions at a point one oh, and then it varies. You know, you can't say that for everybody. It's totally subjective of, of the person. With it, talking about the brainstem autonomic functions, uh, it doesn't mean that you're gonna pee your pants. What it means is, but you've all seen it. Somebody gets to about that level, and what do they do? Bathroom, 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 constantly. That's what we're talking about. That is exactly that level. Um. I got a few As the alcohol enters your body, 20% um, of it is absorbed through your stomach walls. 
80% travels through small intestines, and then eventually it goes into the bloodstream, obviously. And once it's entered your bloodstream, there's not much you can do. You just have to wait for your metabolism to get rid of it. Okay, so drink coffee, uh, take cold showers, none of that stuff's going to work in here. Um, coffee is going to be a stimulant, so in the alcohol is a depressant, so it may wake you up a little bit more. You may feel like you're sober, but you're going out. Although, I'll say, if anybody finds anything, let me know, please. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just a continuation. 2 to 10% of it, uh, right off the bat, is going to be uh, directly expelled through uh, your breath, your tears, uh, sweat, and the other 90 plus percent <coughs> has to go through your body and be metabolized. Um, and most of it takes place in the liver. Okay, so this is the, the guts of it here. On average, a human uh, body will eliminate approximately 0.015% per hour, so it's about, about a drink. But there's several major factors. Uh, gender, or sex is one, body weight and size, food, food in your stomach, tolerance, and amount of proof of alcohol you consume. Uh, gender, <clears throat> alcohol is, has an affinity for water. Um, so your brain and your muscle tissues uh, have a lot of water in them, uh, and your fat tissue has very little. So pound for pound, uh, females contain less water than males. Um, they have more fatty tissue because of reproductive purposes. Uh, there's your there's your nice. He said. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an here's an example. You have a woman and a man. Same size, same weight, same circumstances, the woman's BAC would climb higher than the males. Okay. Because there's less water. Yeah, so there's less water to disperse. Um, so if you're more hydrated, it's actually No, so it almost like thins it out more. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Because it's alcohol gonna spread it. Like it's going to gonna spread it out more, it's go so it's not going to affect you as, as quickly as if... Uh, I don't have an analogy for that. Um, and so for males and females, here's the difference. Uh, 0.015 BAC is about two-thirds of a standard alcohol beverage for males. For females, it's about half. So you're burning. So in an hour, we're estimating most people burn this much. For females, it's about half. So it's about half of a beer, half of a shot, half of a glass of wine. Males, it's two thirds. Here's a, just a quick chart. Number of drinks, your weight. Once again, it's subjective. Yeah. Okay. What time period is this? I'm ready to say Is this an hour while? I believe this is an hour. Yeah. Also, I two drinks and I'd be over in an hour. Once again, there's factors that would yeah, change. Yeah. Okay, so we'll keep going. Food is another, it's a huge thing. Um, depending on how much you ate before you drink, it's going to determine I guess how quickly you become intoxicated and the and how quickly you burn it off and metabolize it, okay? Um, so if you have food in your stomach, it has to uh, you have to partially digest it before it allows uh, before your body allows it to go into your small intestines. And so if you're drinking and there's food in there, um, it's gonna have to wait. The alcohol's gonna soak into the food and it's just gonna sit there until your body starts digesting it, and then it's going to go into your small intestines, which in turn will go into your bloodstream. Okay, so you need food. Um, it's going to take longer for you to, to reach that that buzz or that drunken state, and you're going to actually come down uh, quicker than if you had an empty stomach. Does that make sense? Empty stomach, get drunk faster, get drunk longer, full stomach. So and here's just an example. Tolerance, um, we've all heard of 
tolerance. There's different types of tolerance. Uh, natural tolerance, your stress. Sometimes people do better under stress. So if they're doing the walk and turn and the one leg stand, they may be hammered, but they perform better under stress when there's adrenaline in their system. Um, it's not going to last long. I mean, they're going to see through it, but initially they may appear like they're not drunk or as drunk as they really are. Uh, there's learned tolerance, acquired tolerance. Uh, chronic drinkers, obviously they drink enough and they, they learn how to handle their drunk state. Uh, so they're able to control their gross uh, motor functions better than somebody who doesn't drink. And another factor, obviously, is the type of alcoholic beverage that you're consuming. So, Beer is about 4 to 5 percent, wine about 12, uh, hard liquor proof is, is double the percent, so if you have 80 uh, proof vodka that would be 40 percent alcohol. You wanna, yeah. So this is what you guys were kind of, you're like, well how do I, how do I get pulled over in the first place? And, you know, what are you guys looking for? It is, there's a variety of uh, things that are affecting this. <laughs> You can be weaving side to side, swerving, going down the road, white turns. Big thing, white turns green and they just stay there. You're like, ooh, really? Wow. Might want to pull that one over. <laughs> bounce the curb, you'd be surprised how many people, as I'm pulling them over, will bounce the curb as they come in. And it's great because my end car video is running. You're like, ha, that's funny. Uh, not putting the car in the park or reverse. Yeah, that happens, you know? Okay, so uh, what we're looking for in the people is the slurred speech. As, as we're getting them out of the car, we make contact with people, we come up, and I'm going to be talking to you. It's not just breath odor, because you can drink and drive, right? That's legal, right? It's just you can't be impaired and drive. So I'm coming up and I'm looking for the breath odor, sure. But I'm looking at your eyes, I'm listening to how you're talking to me, how you react to me, what you're reaching for. I'm watching how you, your manual dexterity, your fine motor skills, and how you reach for things. There's a lot that goes into it. And all that kind of stuff, I have to go put in a report. So there's a... There's a lot that we're looking at, a lot that we're trying to process. It's not one thing that's, people say, well, I talk fine. No, that's not that. Okay. Once we get you out of the car, we're going to go into field sobriety maneuvers. First test is the horizontal gaze of staticness. We call it HGN for short. Then you have the walk and turn and the one leg stand. During horizontal gaze of staticness, everybody goes, what are they doing? They're just swinging their eyes, their finger back and forth. What's the big deal? Okay. It's, we're looking for an involuntary jerking motion of the eyes as we're taking it across the side. Okay? Nothing you can control, nothing you can help. It's just naturally there. You can't do anything. There's 45 different types of nystagmus. This is one. Okay? It's the only one caused, the one we look at is the only one caused by alcohol. That's all it is. Okay? So on HGN, when we're doing the weird eye check for you, um, there's well, four things that we're looking at. Um, and there's a total of uh, four points, or six points. Um, total of six points. If we see four out of the six, the stats tell us that there's a 77% chance that you're above a point one. And we're going to do it on these uh, volunteers here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what if they've been drinking? <laughs> the next one is a walk and turn. You guys have seen it. Um, nine steps down, nine steps up. On a straight line, you got to touch heel to toe. Um, and once again, stats tell us that if we see there's eight possible points, um, if we see 
Yeah, if you want to walk, um, then the columnist, there's a 68 percent chance that you're above the weight limit. One leg stand, once again, there's four points. You get two or, two or more, the tunnel is at 65 percent. Combined with HGN and walk and turn, uh, if you're above the uh, if, well, HGN, if you get four out of six, walk and turn, you get two out of eight, 80 percent chance with them combined that you're above. So when you're saying all those numbers, do you have like a yeah, we have form that, that we check oh. a form that we, we kind of check off? If it's really borderline, what do you what do you do? Is like take him in. <laughs> is it like <laughs> when in doubt, like take him, or is it? I That's mean, the great thing like, about my job is I have a, some leeway, and it's uh, I mean I do. Yeah. Um, and it's happened where I might have missed something, maybe something didn't go right, and I'm looking at you, and I know that you're close. And it might be, and the, look, and the you're get not out, getting a big, walk, you're not walk the car, sway, yeah. go. Yeah. So. But like we <coughs> talked about tolerance, okay, a person can pass the walk and turn the one leg stand and think they're fine, the eyes never lie, yeah. never lie. If I get zero points on the uh, physical stuff, and I'm seeing six out of six on the eyes, So and they're they're doing an object. Open them up and drink yeah. and they're Because our transients have DTs. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the same answer. 
but Officer sure, I've had two. So he had, <laughs> so he had three Bud Lights, 12 ounce Bud Lights, and then he had the fourth one was a 16 ounce. Okay, so it's not like he's, you know, wasted. He's dry, yeah, wasted. In what period of time? Like wasted. In, it's an hour. in the last hour? In the last hour, yeah, but it's been like half an hour and a half. It's been about an hour and a half now. So, so do they visibly like jerk? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, I can see it from here. Hey, really? He's getting combative. <laughs> 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 Keep both legs straight, 
Lift down to your toe, arms down your sides. I want you to count out loud. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and so on until I tell you to stop. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand that? I do. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 5, 1,006, lift your shoe a little higher. 
when we come back this other way, you see it again. Oh, wait, it's okay. definitely yeah. there. It is so different. So it's just like moving? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs>
administration of the test. The way you saw the first test, I do, whenever I do field sobriety maneuvers and I've worked with Matt enough, I know he does them the same way. It's not the same way I do mine. It's really close. But I do mine the same way every time. Pass test. Somebody else have a question right here? So, um, say you get somebody and this test says, yep, they're, they're drunk and you take them back. Uh, to, to jail or whatever, wherever you take them. Um, do you then run an actual like alcohol drug test, or you just go with what you have? No, we continue the process after jail. We go through all this again, and then they blow into another machine, which is supposed to be the end all, the, the most reliable thing. We can ask for blood, also. That is an option for us. Um, and while we're doing this. I mean, people are diabetic, and they, they'll appear drunk. I mean, we're, we understand that there's medical conditions, too, so we're eliminating those things also. I, I just kind of ask, I, I work with St. Patrick, and we have a pretty harsh uh, drug policy, and so we've gone through training our managers how to look for a lot of stuff you're talk to, talked about and kind of teaching them about how much alcohol or how much drug would stay in your system for how long, because we're looking for impairment. Um, and, and trying to find that, but then we take them over and actually have them do a urine test. So I was wondering if we did a follow up because that's the kind of our piece. That's the only way we can confirm it. That's probably more for drug diversion. Yeah, 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 it's it's for alcohol. Alcohol. yeah. For us, you know, it's, it's, it's the big thing is is alcohol is such a it's a central nervous system depressant, but it's such an overpowering drug that it, in combination with those drugs. We really got to push that aside. If we have enough in alcohol, we just take the alcohol. So if we get to the jail, there isn't a whole lot of processing both ways or trying to get both things. It's up to Matt and I. We'll, we'll decide. Uh, somebody calls us up. We we'll say, "Hey, what do, we, what do we have?" And we decide whether we're going for drugs or whether we're going for alcohol. It's all about you guys. Yeah. It's just how we process it. That's good. Any other questions? I just got a comment from Susan saying I was a possible juror on a trial a few months ago and the guy refused all the tests and got convicted on the video. We had a video on the whole thing and yeah. picked him on that video. And so on. I've, I've been on two DUI juries. The first one, the guy didn't do any of the tests. The video, clearly drunk. The second one, the guy was a diabetic. He had problems with his legs. He couldn't do the field test. I think he failed the, the that one. And, find, and, and the video he looked, we, we, if he blew, and he blew a 2.4. And if we didn't have that, we, we would have let that guy off. Because he, he had his faculties about him. He, he had just, he was really habituated to it, and, and, yes. and he could do the stuff. And, and that just happens fine. in uh, some of the transient staff down will be walking, and, you know, 0.3. I would be comatose at point yeah. three. Okay. So that's just a tolerance that they build up. I mean, it's sad, but it's there. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, really quick.